Great, guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from who have joined from all parts of the world and registered for this great event, which is happening today. Hope you and your family are doing safe in the COVID times. Uh, our company's best wishes are with all of you. Today, we are having a lovely and unique event around the factory of the future. So if you guys want to know how technology is driving the factory and how smart we are factory get in 10 years from now, then you are in the right place. We'll all go over them and give lots of insight to all of you. Along with some great talks, which we have, that is a four great talks, we have a panel, power pack panel discussion as well, themed around the factory of the future and was, what is its outlook. I'm sure it will add a flavor and also provide you deep insight into how factories are getting transformed, driven by emerging technologies. So let's begin uh, the day, guys. I will introduce myself and the company to you. My name is Nitin Naveen and I will be a host for the day. I'm working as Vice President Innovation Strategy at AI Core Spot. I have been joined by my colleague Arvin and Naveen, who will also assist me in keeping the event lively and resolving technical glitches if it comes in between. So thanks a lot to them for putting in hard work and making this one a huge success. We'll pro try to provide a seamless experience to all of you so that you can gain maximum output out of the same. Let me provide a brief background to all of you about AI Core Spot, as you have maybe you have not heard about it so much. We started last year, backed up by our technology partner, Digit7. Our focus is to provide all of you a deep dive in all the sectors, wherever technology is there. Every, and every, every month, the theme is different. We are gaining momentum month on month. Our aim is to be number one AI-driven community all over the world so that like-minded people like you can be a part of the same in supporting, growing, and making it a success. We'll continue to do industry-backed hybrid events and the webinars. The knowledge repository will be made from reliable data through subject matter experts, thought leaders, industry leaders, and our technology partner, Digit7. We'll enrich the content through whatever medium we get, like digital content, newsletters, podcasts, blogs, videos, to shed light on this industry. Our mission is to serve as a hub for information regarding Industry 4.0, which includes AR, VR, IoT, AI, ML, deep learning, digital twin, robotics, blockchain, analytics, edge AI, 5G, drone, edge computing, cloud, and whatever technology you can think on. We we'll keep on adding that. Today's event is one series of events which we have planned for this year, power packed with speakers' presentation and panel discussion. Again, I'll tell you the theme. It's around the role of uh, technology in supply chain industry with a firm focus on the factories. There are lots more in store for subsequent months as well with focus on transportation, image annotation, retail industry, aviation, and so on. So request all of you to go through our website, aicoresport.io, for future updates. Also, please like our social media handles, which will keep you all updated on everything what we propose to offer in the coming months to follow. Before starting with the day, I would like to highlight a few things so that it can set up the tone for the amazing learning and networking day. Hope you all guys can see the slide of Digit 7. Uh, you can just click on that slide and will, uh, there's a pin option after that. So we are lucky to have Chitray Mani, who is the CEO of Digit 7 with us, who will also moderate the panel discussion. A special mention to Digit7 as they have helped us in understanding our vision and supporting us to create a platform like this through which we can help achieve our objectives. The support is immense and they have provided us a push to create awareness about emerging technologies in all the industries 4.0 era. So some introduction about Digit7 as, as, as it is very unfair to not give an introduction about them. So Digit7 has an innovation team they create unique platforms and products catering to the industry 4.0 who is looking out for innovation. Their products are designed to solve real-time problems and are customizable to suit anybody's business. Adding to that, the products which they have can scale up at ease as business grows. Their association with trusted brands such as AWS, Azure, IBM, SaaS, Adobe, Salesforce, Sterling Commons, amongst others, help them constantly upskill practitioners and champion the partner's best delivery methodologies. Professionally, they are closely associated with 
lot of great bodies like Tech Titans, Forbes Technology Council, Comptia, Richardson IQ, University of Texas Dallas, and much more technology brain power to leverage their contrasting standpoints and diverse skill sets. In a short span of time, Digit 7 has created storm in the market with 15 plus patents, which speaks of itself. As every one of you can see, they have four great products mentioned in the slide. I'll quickly touch upon them so that you all get a glimpse of that. As you can see, the first one we have is Digit 7 Digit Shelves, which is an IoT driven shelves and transform retail with reliable and accurate on shelf inventory management system. Second one is Digit 7 Tag Square which is AI powered auto annotator with 80% downsized hands-on work. It's the optimal automation solution suitably designed for all deep learning and computer vision applications, including object recognition, behavior analysis, and facial recognition. The third one, which you can see is Digit 7 D Grab, which is a tech-driven frictionless cashierless store for a super simplified shopping experience that lets you shop in and out faster. And the beauty is that it's easier and much more convenient than the online shopping as well. The fourth one which you can see is called Digit 7 Fly Robo. It includes autom autonomous drone with non-GPS warehouse on inventory management at the retailer's end. Amongst all the great features, it is designed to fly indoors where GPS is not accessible. One can gain 10 times more impact on inventory counts with smart drone technology while keeping stock of inventory effortlessly. The beauty about all the four products which they have is that they are customizable, cost effective, and can be used in every industry where technology is needed. To get a demo and understand more in depth and details, kindly get in touch with their sales team through www.digit7.io and I'm sure they will keep deep insights into each one of them and resolve your pain points as well. They have a big innovative lab of 15,000 square feet in Richardson, Texas. And any one of you who are dropping by can always go to their office and have a look to feel that. Now moving on and coming to our technology and community partners for today, which is very important. It includes InfoVision, Sotayog, Strategic Sourcing Dynamics, Tradion, Wombat, Cummins Filtration, Circlean, Ashow Energy, and Product Modeling Corporation. So these great companies have come together to make this event a success. A special mention to speakers and attendees of the event who registered and came today to achieve their objectives through this forum. End of the day, if you gain few things out of this or get to network with each other, know each other, then our, our core objective as a platform will be achieved. The one thing which I want to let you know, if you want to ask questions, those who are in the audience, it's very important. They can type in the Q&A section, which is there at the right corner of the menu option. You can type in as, when the, as the speaker speaks and we'll try to get it answered after each talk or as per the time permitted. There's also a hands button at the bottom of the screen, which you all can see. You can raise the hand and come to the stage to ask questions in video format to the speakers as well. Now I'll quickly go through the agenda and let you all get introduced to the speakers and their topic. So let me share the screen. Hope my screen is visible to all of you. Yeah. So uh, we are starting exactly in the next four minutes. The first speaker is Abhilash Vantaram, who is the Director of Digital Innovation at InfoVision. His topic is how the industry is shaping up and the technology is driving this change. Uh, then we have a panel discussion from 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. It's a one hour panel discussion. The factory of the future and why, what is its outlook? Chitrai Mani, who is the CEO of Digit7, is the moderator of this panel discussion. We have Sara, who is the CEO of Satyog. Then we have Adam, who is the president of Strategic Source in Dynamic. Joshua is their founder and CEO, Tradion. Then we have John, who is the founder of Bombard. And Sanjeev Khot, who is the di director of Global Supplier Quality Cumin's Filtration. So all these guys will take on the panel discussion. Then we have three great talks after the panel discussion by Suzanne, who is the founder and uh, president and CEO, Sarkli. Her topic is MRO of the future. Then we have Mazda, who's the CTO of Ashau Energy. His topic is big step towards digitization in oil and gas. 
Then we have Nick, who is the VP Production Modeling Corporation. His topic is industrial and system engineering. And then we are close for the day. Hope you all guys will have a great time uh, in this panel discussion and the, and the great, lovely four talks which we are having for the day. So let me hand over the stage to Avilash, who is the Director of Digital Innovation from InfoVision. He's the first speaker. He has an exciting topic, factory of the future, and how the technology is driving this change. I'm sure it will set up the flavor for the day. Over to you, Abhi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes. And uh, let me go ahead and present my screen so everybody is sure. able to see that. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much, Nathan. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, good morning to all of the panelists today and uh, my co-speakers as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to share this time with all of you, and uh, thank you, Airspot, uh, for having me here today. Uh, as Nitin mentioned, I'm Abhilash Vantaram. I go by Abhi, and I head the Innovation and uh, Research and uh, Development Division across industries for InfoVision. And I have been fortunate uh, to get an opportunity to work with some of the most amazing leaders and technology brains from many industries, including manufacturing and, and others, and uh, exploring innovative ways powered by emerging technologies to drive change in those subject, in those industries. And uh, I'm excited to share some of my thoughts and learnings uh, on the factory of future and which technologies would potentially be leading uh, the, the influencer ladder uh, in getting us there. So let's get started. So everyone here uh, probably is familiar with the industrial revolution and the ongoing evolution into Industry 4.0. A quick recap. Starting from 18th century with mechanical production equipment powered by steam uh, energy um, and uh, to the 19th century that has seen mass production assembly lines that required labor and uh, electrical energy. Then in the 20th century uh, is electronics and IT enabled uh, automated production referred to as industry 3.0 that all of us know. Uh, and today and moving into the next decade, we will be looking into the next evolution of industry 4.0, where intelligent production equipped with IoT, cloud, emerging technologies, and powered by the data enable better production. So while um, the industry continues to evolve, the challenges that manufacturers constantly face are also growing. The constant pressure for faster fulfillment with uncompromising quality the need to optimize efficiencies and productivities and so on, right? Uh, all while reducing costs and increasing production complexity. It's definitely not fun. And to trump that, black swan events like COVID, uh, the pandemics, uh, weather and natural disasters, shipping disruptions like the Suez Canal blockage, global unrest, all of these have had heavy impacts on manufacturers. Um, supply chain disruptions, delivery delays, increased costs, rapid shifts in demands. And all of these cause a lot of uncertainty as you, uh, you know, start looking at the landscape, right? And organizations have to adapt uh, to deal with uh, potential future disruptions. As if that's not enough, uh, let's look at some of the additional impacts today's manufacturing uh, industry has on key areas like sustainability. Manufacturing represents 54% of global energy consumption and over 20% of global emissions, according to a, a, a study by one of the leading research institutes. And on the flip side, as all of us can agree, streamlining waste management and green processes and things like these would have a significant impact on the total cost incurred as well. So all of these and uh, others have primed the manufacturing industry to change. And uh, naturally, there is a lot of focus on enabling some of these changes through automation. Um, in a global survey for over 1,000 organizations performed by one of the leading uh, research groups, um, uh, we've actually seen that more than 50% of CEOs and about 70% of the board of directors are uh, demanding accelerated growth and operational excellence. 
And in line with that, over 80% of organizations are expecting to increase strategic initiatives on um, digital business initiatives in 2022 itself. Uh, over 70% of organizations have demonstrated intent to shorten their implementation timelines for all of these initiatives. And um, in fact, more than 56% of organizations uh, in the study have an average of four or more concurrent hyper automation initiatives underway. And some of the leading companies have actually over 10 major large scale hyper automation initiatives. Uh, and there is at least a 15% of uh, average increase in R&D investments globally for high value manufacturing within this year. And smart factories are expected to boost the global economy by uh, over 1.5 trillion within the next uh, couple of years or so. And these are some staggering numbers. Um, right. And how are these organizations looking at achieving these targets? Well, the good news is with uh, Industry 4.0 and the pragmatism of uh, connected ecosystems, the natural next major performance leap in factories will be through end to end uh, effectiveness of production systems, ultimately leading into hyper automation and the factory of the future or what we also refer to as smart factories or intelligent factories. So what makes a factory smart or futuristic compared to most of the factories that are there today? And what is a smart, smart factory, um, right? So simply put, a smart factory looks towards gaining significant improvements in productivity, quality, flexibility, and service by leveraging digital technologies and connected ecosystems. The underlying capability of smart, fact, uh, smart manufacturing is the application of different combinations of modern technologies uh, to create a hyper-flexible, self-adapting manufacturing capability. Uh, now, that sounds both enticing as well as intimidating as well. And uh, there is a study that uh, rethinking manufacturing, production, and distribution could actually eliminate 45% of global em emissions. Um, now that should definitely be enticing, right? So for these reasons and many other reasons, um, factories have become consistently uh, appearing in the global top 10 technology trends from various research organizations like uh, the Gartners and Foresters of the world. But before we look into these exciting technologies, aspects and possibilities, um, let us uh, take uh, a step back and uh, generalize uh, a little bit. So if you look at the wider applicable industries there are, uh, that are relevant in the space, not necessarily all inclusive, but like manufacturing uh, with retail, CPG, chemicals, et cetera, or energy with uh, oil and gas and utilities, uh, transportation and logistics uh, as a key player in the ecosystem, um, health, uh, HLS and, and pharmas, engineering and construction, aerospace, and so on and so forth, right? And if we start identifying some functional and impact-driven areas, again, this list is not inclusive, uh, but looking at uh, areas like resource planning for plant layout and others, manufacturing planning, uh, operational efficiencies and productivity improvements, flexibility and agility uh, for um, a rapid uh, production model, uh, energy management, supply chain planning and optimization, workforce engagement, uh, their training, their safety and health, environmental compliance and uh, sustainability goals, quality management um, and waste management, and so on and so forth. There are so many areas, uh, functional areas that can have a major impact on how we can optimize and be a lot more efficient. Now, holistically, we can look at a few technology blanket solutions that can drive the desired outcomes. These solutions will be a combination of many smaller solutions and uh, technologies that have uh, to come together, right? So starting at uh, a macro level with smart factory solutions itself that can provide a well-connected, automated and transparent shop floor and ensure equipment effectiveness um, and, and things like those. These in turn will be enabled by smart equipment solutions powered by industrial IoT that is connected and available and uh, propel data-driven insights and actions. In conjunction with uh, smart uh, workforce solutions that are um, empowering and able to work with the smart equipment and connected shop floor, uh, a traceable, 
predictable, flexible, and knowledge-driven digital supply chain solutions. Everything enabled by a web of data that intelligence and knowledge can be derived from to make autonomous and reliable data-driven decisions that will enable the goals of uh, closed-loop manufacturing um, and protected by security solutions. So ultimately, transforming manufacturing starts with shared data and connected tech. However, think of smart factories um, as uh, a specific kind of smart spaces where frontline workers and technologies interact in an open, connected, and coordinated fashion. So there is no one dominant technology combination uh, for smart factories, right? So it's, it has to be a combination of multiple, multiple technologies. So now let's look at a framework and some enablers that can make this happen. If you look at the core building blocks that will constitute a smart factory, we look at industrial IoT, um, as well as some lighter IoT devices and sensors, cameras, and things like those. And then autonomous things that supplement existing workers and processes, and how they get connected with the ecosystems. These constitute the, the uh, core building blocks for us. Now, if we abstract out of these core building blocks, we can start looking at additional technology enablers like real-time connectivity and responsiveness, um, automation, artificial intelligence and machine learning, analytics, data and knowledge that can be de derived from the data, uh, and other di digital technologies. All of these would enable the building blocks, for instance, like various applications of robotics, robotic arms, and so on, to exploit artificial intelligence to intelligently automate processes and support the convergence of smart factories with other supply chain functions. And then uh, there are non-technology strategic enablers that organizations have to be very focused on. Uh, this is where the chances of failure of achievement uh, of the Zen state is likely to happen, right? Uh, these uh, are aspects like figuring out the handshake between IT and OT and the gap between them, uh, processes like change management, etc. For today's topic, we will be focused on more on the technology aspects and not necessarily the strategy aspects, but I just wanted to uh, present that as part of the wider framework. Now, let's break down um, into the technologies of today that are best applicable and are actually being implemented within these enablers. Um, they're... Um, there are some usual suspects that uh, all of us are probably already aware of and are guessing. Um, and for convenience, we can break these into simpler categories, uh, though they may not necessarily be a one-on-one -on -one match here. So first, uh, let's look at intelligent, driven, and derived tech that is being used today. First and foremost, uh, no surprises there, uh, industrial IoT. With uh, IIoT and data produced for analysis, factories can quickly identify potential maintenance issues uh, before they lead to downtime. And many automotive factories actually today, for instance, are moving to a 24 hour production plant. Um, next in the list is autonomous things like robots and uh, drones with a good bit of autonomy in them, right? For instance, uh, robots are able to take on heavy and uh, repetitive activity. So the manufacturing cycles are quicker and uh, if you look at the automobile industry, for instance, vehicles come out to the market a lot more rapidly now. Um, in, in fact, uh, I've read that an automaker is using autonomous things to reduce inventory storage by about 60%, which was very impressive. And drones are being used to detect possible oil and gas leaks uh, at an early stage and at locations that are difficult to reach, like offshore places and everything. And they can also be used to identify weak spots in, in complex networks of pipelines and many other such use cases. And naturally, some of these things lead to computer vision and uh, uh, image and video analytics that can be used for so many use cases like quality control, auditing, safety and health, and even mount these on drones or robots for what they need to do. So next category is uh, digital where we find obvious technologies like cloud and edge compute uh, that enable massive uh, data analysis and processing at scale and in, re in near real time. 
no surprises uh, here to see digital twins in this list of uh, active technology exploration. Digital twins are being explored and worked towards applications of multiple use cases, like simulating the plant layout, the flows, uh, assets and resources um, that um, are needed to produce uh, products efficiently and in safe environments. Essentially, the resource planning aspects that we talked about earlier. And similar things are being explored uh, for manufacturing planning. Uh, that we also talked about earlier, right? And uh, robotic process automation, RPA, is another usual suspect that, that we can expect to see here. So many processes and back-end jobs being automated that saves tons of time and productivity. Uh, 3D printing and additive manufacturing has been in recent news, as you guys may, may recall, for manufacturing personal protective equipment for um, COVID for healthcare professionals uh, in the last couple of years. So many applications, again, for 3D printing across industries these days, right? So no surprise that we're seeing that here. Um, I also do have uh, traditional PLM tools, uh, MES and SCADA systems uh, that are still going to be there in the whole ecosystem for data and operations. Though these are not obviously emerging technologies, so I'll still add them here. Um, lastly, coming to connectivity, uh, 5G and 5G Edge are key buzzwords in the industry today and are actively being evaluated or adopted by many organizations, even if it is for small scale experimentation at this time. Uh, LoRa uh, Long Range is a very good alternative for 5G, especially in remote areas where 5G is not available. It's not uh, a replacement for 5G, but it's a really good alternative for those remote areas. But ultimately, if you work through the mesh of technologies and enablers, the three key digital technologies that enable smart factories are connectivity, um, leveraging industrial IoT to collect data from existing equipment and new sensors, intelligent automation, uh, for instance, um, advanced robotics, machine vision, distributed control, drones, uh, things like those, and cloud scale, um, data management and analytics, implementing predictive analytics, AI, intelligence, and knowledge. These are uh, essentially the three, uh, the three key uh, digital technologies to enable smart uh, factories ultimately. Now, most of you may already uh, have been familiar with these technologies, right? So let's quickly draw attention to some, uh, uh, some highly bleeding edge technologies that are going to be prevalent in the smart factories and the not too distant future from now, right? So um, again, going through um, through the cycle um, or the categories again, um, intelligent process automation, IPA, right? So we've seen RPA, we've talked about AI and ML. IPA is when we infuse intelligence and context to RPA. This will be a major game changer into the future. And uh, while there are already AMRs or the uh, autonomous mobile robots in play today, we can expect a major shift in, uh, in the space and a lot more adoption across clothes for AMRs. Uh, that's going to be a huge game changer moving forward. Uh, we can also expect to see a lot of uh, human robot collaborative work, apart from the robot to robot collaborative work in an assembly line through these uh, uh, collaborative robots or what we call cobots, right? That's going to be uh, one of the most uh, pervasive and prevalent uh, technologies that we'll see. Um, intelligent web or web 3.0, that uh, term that you, uh, that you might be familiar with, which is driven by data, information, and knowledge engineering, will be one of the most impactful technologies in this space, especially in creating a web of data that machines um, uh, can understand and interpret and derive intelligence from. Uh, end of the day, we are looking at machine to machine communication, machine to human communication, and that whole collaborative mesh to happen very seamlessly. And today's technologies do not essentially enable the way computers work and the way data uh, is read. Uh, they do not necessarily enable that speed of knowledge engineering, which is going to be extremely important in making this happen. Now, um, We've uh, talked about the edge being used, but um, bringing the contextual intelligence to the edge, it's a huge game changer. And with so much vision-based uh, intelligence to be derived, uh, 
tagging solutions for object detection, scene recognition, uh, behavior analysis, and things like those will be a huge play into the future. And um, neuromorphic computer is a major, major player moving forward. Uh, we are able to derive a lot of value from traditional cameras, sensors, chips, but a chip that can truly simulate a brain in its thinking, uh, in its uh, processing, in its communication, memory, organic and recursive learning, its ability to capture and process events at a speed of microsecond. That's just mind blowing. With, uh, even with the limited uh, neuromorphic computing tech that is currently available, we can still place a camera to identify the maintenance needs of a machine purely based on how it is vibrating uh, at a microsecond level, right? And uh, the ability to, for instance, count pills uh, in a factory that are falling off the belt in thousands per second. So all of these are actually possible by a neuromorphic chip uh, that uh, can actually instantly figure, out, figure things out at a microsecond level. This is gonna be a huge game changer into the future, especially in, in, uh, in uh, the factory of the future as well. And uh, synthetic data is a big game changer as data and representative data is golden. And sometimes it can be in short supply. Uh, synthetic data can help us overcome a lot of the problem, which is required for training machine learning uh, solutions or whatnot. But in, in certain other cases, uh, because of the siloed operations and everything, how do you share the data? Synthetic data can be a huge game changer there. And um, biologics, biotech, um, these can change the way we dispose waste uh, and conversely convert waste to reusable resources. Think about the impact on the environment, not just the bottom line, right? but the environment is going to have a major impact because of these things. And similarly with nanotech as well. Now, coming to digital, we are going to be looking at uh, real adoption of uh, tech like blockchain um, in a more broader way, not just in supply chain, but in many other areas across the industry. Augmented reality, virtual reality, and immersive experience, which also overlap a bit with wearables, can change how factory workers perceive the digital world and interact with it. Augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, these technologies will drive future immersive user experiences, assembly line instructions, uh, worker shift transitions, digital twin visualizations, uh, training, flow visualization, data visualization, machinery overlay, um, planning, plant setup, inventory is talking, you name it. There are so many use cases in terms of um, uh, how uh, the whole mixed reality and the extended reality space is going to be extremely impactful. One of the most impactful technologies that is going to be coming up uh, and being adopted as well. But in many smart factories, um, there are fast and easily measurable impacts from using AR in maintenance, quality, and complex uh, assembly processes. But despite the quick win potential, uh, Challenges with workforce upskilling and their digital dexterity could prove difficult in many organizations. So there are definitely challenges there. And owing to black swan events and cybersecurity attacks, et cetera, um, and how that impacted how we think about accessibility and availability. It is expected that factories would want uh, to more and more remote monitor and operate uh, equipment and their entire flows for that matter. Now, while 3D printing is exciting, 4D printing could be a game changer in certain spaces and products like dynamic structures, um, self-healing polymers, uh, self-assembled space antennas, um, oil and gas exploration, uh, etc. Right. So apart from the 3D printing, um, actually a fourth coordinate of time is associated that can change the structure based on external stimuli like pressure and temperature using uh, shape shifting printers and stimulus uh, responsive materials. So while we haven't included that here, the material changes in the industry is going to be a huge game changer moving forward as well. And uh, in line with that, um, quantum computing uh, is also going to be uh, a major, major player moving forward. For instance, if you want to start looking at process changes or pro process optimizations, uh, quantum computing is, is uh, one of those technologies that can actually be extremely uh, wealthy in terms of uh, how it processes the data, how it understands the different scenarios and come back and tell us that, um, hey, you know what, this is how your floor or your, your assembly line is operating. 
these are the kind of changes that you need to make to make it a lot more efficient. And it has explored all possible options and come back to us with the right recommendations, um, purely based on how it is looking at the activities happening in the floor, right? So huge, huge play for quantum computing in the space. Uh, 3D scanning and photometry to reconstruct uh, a structure will be a very good addition to the uh, tech stack uh, that we can expect. And not to mention the latest buzzwords, metaverse and omniverse, they'll have telling impact. Once the, once the kinks of governance, uh, security, standardization, aspects like those are figured out in the next few years. Coming to connectivity, we can expect to see some advantages coming in from C-band to, uh, to begin with. Not necessarily in terms of the bandwidth or increased bandwidth, but in terms of access and availability. C-band waves can bend through structures uh, to reach everywhere as opposed to the normal 5G millimeter waves or other waves that stop after an obstruction. So the ability to bend and reach uh, is going to give a lot more pervasiveness and availability uh, of the network itself. And eventually 6G uh, will be huge with its uh, um, expected, um, um, 6G with its uh, expected microsecond latency and expected over 100 plus times faster than 5G uh, bandwidth and speeds. Uh, when it becomes available in the next several years. They're still talking about 2030 at this point, but as we look into the future, that's going to be a huge, huge game changer too. Now, let's also add a new category here for cybersecurity, given the advancements that have been happening in this space. Uh, and cybersecurity is one of the biggest, biggest risk areas for the factory of the future, so we need to address that, right? So this category will be critical for the future. Technologies like zero trust and network level security uh, where uh, zero trust products are going to have a completely different way of obstructing any attacks that can happen uh, because as the name suggests, it is zero trust. Uh, it has to validate everything. Uh, Self-diagnosing networks will be absolutely critical given the change in the landscape of machines, the sensors and the vulnerabilities that uh, these can open up. Uh, fully homomorphic computing is another technology that will have a major impact on the future. It gives the ability to operate with encrypted data at rest. So data is encrypted 24 by seven with no window for any vulnerabilities. And we can still operate with it the way we wish to, whether we want to uh, work with the data, understand the data of, uh, or uh, you know, train machine learning models with the data, you do not have to decrypt data anymore moving forward, right? So that will be a huge game changer as well. And, Almost every one of these, um, uh, almost every one of these uh, technologies is in the top tech trends in the industry, um, or it is in the hype cycle. These advancements are going to be phenomenal for not only the smart factories, but many other industries and consumer spaces as well. Very exciting uh, time, guys. Now, while this tech, tech is exciting, um, there was a study done by a research group to identify the relative positioning of technologies deployed versus perceived benefits of executives across the globe. And on the x-axis uh, is the current adoption or rather deployment of the technology uh, in factories. And on the y-axis is the perception of the benefit potential from these organizations, executives in this sample space. Um, it is actually interesting to see the perception here while logic and uh, our architectural minds dictate otherwise in some cases. However, as of now, theoretically speaking, some of these, the way um, they are in this in these quadrants don't seem to be in the right quadrants, uh, but there could be a number of reasons for it. Education, uh, siloed implementations and subsequent failures to derive those values, uh, improper implementations, premature duns that uh, probably are, are, are uh, uh, premature studies that have uh, been done or things like those. Right? But I for one strongly believe this per perception will change once the implementations and adoption start moving towards the right direction and the strategy initiatives align with the technology implementation. So with all of these, how can we expect a factory of the future to look like? From plant control uh, tower to floor automation, to information management and automated quality controls to energy and sustainability and equipment efficiencies and workforce efficiencies and safety. This is the hopeful future in the next decade or maybe even less. So it's very, very exciting times on how these technologies can actually enable uh, you know, a lot of hidden uh, efficiencies and activities that we can gain. 
Now, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, quickly skip through some of these things, but there are definitely challenges uh, the manufacturing industry and smart factories in general will face. Uh, and uh, for example, cybersecurity, IoT convergence, and uh, one of the most important things that uh, we've seen is that the deployment integration of digital platforms and technologies, that is of paramount importance. You need to look at finding the right solutions, the right vendors, um, there are techno functional gaps that need to be addressed. Uh, so there are a lot of these things apart from the strategic challenges that you will see. So please uh, do choose wisely. And um, I'm going to skip through uh, a couple of these slides because uh, we're almost already at the top of the time. But since I haven't talked to you about who we are, uh, I just want to spend a minute here and uh, tell you that, you know, um, we are in provision an IT services and products organization focused on innovation as well as enterprise technologies. We have over 3000 experts across 12 global offices. Uh, we've been the partner behind the digital and innovation transformations for many fortune organizations. Uh, some of them are listed here. And uh, um, from a transformation roadmap perspective, while we created a framework for smart factories that map capabilities and objectives and recommendations of the approach best practices and things like those. However, to recognize and acknowledge that one size does not fit all in terms of the transformation roadmap, right? So um, uh, with that in, uh, uh, with that context, I do want to mention that, you know, this is a list of InfoVision's uh, products. Some of these are partner products as well in the value chain that we work very closely with and how they map to different areas of smart factory realization complemented with our services and frameworks or accelerators and our extensive capabilities with emerging technologies and innovation mindset and processes are specific as well as cross domain expertise and more importantly, our ability to bridge that techno functional gap sets us apart. Um, I know we are already at the top of uh, the time here uh, and uh, I definitely hope this was informative. Uh, uh, with that, I'd like to see if there are any questions. Uh, and again, uh, Nathan, if you're already at the top of the time, I can always take those questions or an email uh, or however the channels are. Um, my coordinates are here. I believe this deck is going to be shared with uh, everyone uh, by the AI Core Spot team. So please feel free to hit me up if you have any questions or just want to grab a cup of coffee or a virtual coffee. So thank you everyone for your time, patience, and probably the 10 cups of coffee you guys might have uh, had to endure in the last 30 minutes. Um, so with that, uh, any questions or Nitin, I'll give the floor back to you. Sure. Thank you, Abhi. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely presentation and setting up the tone for this amazing day for the factory. And you had some amazing questions, which set up a lot of things uh, for the other speakers to follow. Uh, I think the presentation was very exciting. And as you rightly told in the end, that this presentation will be shared with all, all the audience as well as the speakers so that they can insi get insight into this. And uh, obviously, they can get in touch with you as well. Uh, just the audience who have joined late, uh, this event is broadcast, broadcasted live on the YouTube page. So you can always go back at the end of the event and you can look at the uh, recording anytime. So guys, we'll quickly move on to the next one. I think there's no question for Abhi. So yeah, done. Done, Abhi. Thank you. So thank we'll you so much, on. everyone. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you, Abhi. So we'll quickly move on to our great panel discussion. Uh, the next one, very exciting and uh, very informative. I think uh, we have five to six great leaders here, six great leaders, actually, for this panel discussion. Really excited. And uh, love to see you all in this panel discussion moderated by Chitray, who's the CEO of Digit7. Over to you, Chitray. Thanks, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I see almost uh, six people. Am I right? Yeah. So there, there are uh, uh, five great speakers, Chitray. So Sara yeah. is there, Adam is there, uh, Joshua is there, John is there, and Sanjeev is there. Okay, sounds great. Uh, uh, thanks for all of your time. Uh, and uh, if people are not in this uh, panel, could you please disable the video because it's confusing in the chat for me. Okay, yeah, I'm good. Thanks, thanks everyone. Um, and uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, uh, thanks, Abhi, for the first uh, presentation. It went really well, very informative. I hope everyone enjoyed his presentation as well. 
It's very informative. Um, we would like to let me quickly introduce myself to the team, uh, to the audience as well. I'm Chitra Mani. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Digit7, pretty much an innovation-based product uh, focus company. And uh, I'm from Dallas, and I'm here. Thanks for the opportunity from within uh, for me to moderate this session and work. And uh, we have been doing this for quite more than a year. It's very interesting and successful uh, happening for about one year. And picking up more, I'm seeing a lot of great leaders are joining, and they are, we are coaching together as well. And thanks for the partnership with it. And we would like to take a moment mm -hmm. to quickly give a, a 30 seconds quick introduction by yourself one by one. Um, Sarah, why can't you start introducing yourself quickly to the audience? Yeah, of course. Um, really excited to be here. My name is Sarah Kamalarasan. I'm CEO and co-founder of Soda OG. Uh, I have a long background in oil and gas and heavy industrials with real-time data. Uh, we spent millions getting real-time data. So currently what Soda OG does is we harness that real-time data and convert it to cash flow value and recommendations. So we have AI, ML models. A lot of it is very engineering based. And it's very focused on operations. So we're, yeah, we you know, work very closely with COOs in heavy industries. And uh, yeah, Welcome really to excited to be here. Sure. Uh, Adam, why can't you take me? Adam, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Adam Shavitz, president of Strategic Sourcing Dynamics, LLC. Uh, I work with clients from startups to global corporations on setting up and optimizing their supplier selection uh, and at the same time working with engineering and supplier uh, technical teams on design for manufacturability and assembly and essentially helping uh, clients to accelerate product from R&D through prototyping small, mid and high volume production. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Sanjeev? Morning, all. And uh, my name is Sanjeev Koth. I'm the director for supplier quality for Cummins Filtration. We manufacture uh, different kind of filters, uh, oil filter, fuel filters, and then also air filters for uh, you know all, all, all heavy duty and then uh, uh, medium duty vehicles. And uh, I'm the director of supplier quality, taking care of all quality, and uh, you know I'm responsible to drive. Uh, a lot of industry 4.0 initiatives and uh, bringing this new initiatives in terms of manufacturing and uh, i'm excited to be here to really participate and then also learn from all of you thank you thanks thanks sanjeev uh do you want to go with jane <clears throat> oh yes um uh, morning my name's uh, john verhart um, um founder and uh, ceo of uh, wombat fatigue management uh, we have a system to uh, to uh, uh, predict the fatigue of uh, workers in industry and uh, and transport by uh, by monitoring the by analysing the voice. So it's an uh, artificial intelligence technology which we developed for the European Space Agency uh, for the up future manned missions to Mars, where um, fatigue of the astronauts was seen to be one of the key risk factors. And we're now applying this technology to uh, industry uh, uh, throughout the world. Thank, thank John for the intro. Uh, Joshua. Yeah, good morning. My name is Joshua. I'm the founder and CEO of Tradion. We're developing technologies designed specifically to leverage second life batteries. That is batteries that were once used in EVs that still have about 80% of the life still in them. Uh, we've developed technologies to utilize those for energy storage applications. Uh, I've spent the last 20 plus years working with industries all across North America from retail, manufacturing, healthcare, et cetera, and developing, implementing technologies that really help them improve or secure their operations. So I look forward to this conversation and discussion. Sounds great. Thanks, everyone. So uh, let me start the discussion of the future of the factory. Very, very, uh, very interesting topic. Uh, so far, we talked about um, uh, what is AI in retail or blockchain in uh, banking. Like that, we always host that even ho co-hosted the event. But this is the first time we have been hosting uh, the future of the factories more conceptualized with multi-technology based. 
and I'm really excited to talk with you all and grab your brain from here. Um, okay, so what, what are you guys seeing? I would like to start first generally. What is the industry trend is going on in factory of the future, especially in the manufacturing industry? Uh, who would like to take this question? What is the industry trend? Uh, it is it is started hyping too much or it is still very early stage or people are aggressively moving on that model? Um, who would like to take this question? Adam? Sorry, I just had some background noise here. Uh, so the factory of the future, I work with a lot of clients that are involved with uh, collaborative robots. And this was mentioned in the in the presentation. Uh, and what you're going to see more and more really at the beginning of this, uh, it's, it's really a revolution. The collaborative robots are essentially robots that are relatively inexpensive compared to the traditional heavy duty uh, type of robots you would see, say, in a traditional auto manufacturer. So these are much less expensive. You're talking sometimes 30000 to $100,000. The payback time is only one to two years. They work directly with labor side by side. They don't need safety cages. They're very safe. Uh, they can be programmed by anyone. You don't need engineering teams. And what you're going to see is this collaboration between robots and people becoming very common. And uh, the early adopters right now are the logistics industry. You're seeing tens of thousands of these used uh, in warehouses, roaming around warehouses, uh, not just Amazon, but many of them. Uh, and you're going to see increasing adoption in the food industry uh, and others. And then finally, robotics is starting to meld with uh, automotive and other types of autonomous vehicles. And for sure, it's coming. You're going to see trucking in other areas adopting robotics technology uh, so that we can deal with the labor shortages uh, uh, in trucking. So I really see collaborative robots as augmenting humans, uh, not necessarily replacing them, but really augmenting them. And yeah, taking that's what I want, I want to comment on that statement. I'm glad you made the statement that yeah. it's not replacing, it is collaborating. Okay, you're yeah. okay. yeah. getting panic from his statement. Yeah, please go ahead, Adam. <laughs> right. So, right. So one of the robots I work on uh, for a warehouse actually roams the warehouse with the worker, brings them to the right package, carries the package for them. So it's allowing that one worker to be, you know, twice as productive and also not to uh, well, have do, do, you, do you see that what your point you are trying to say that it is picking up or still early stage? Where are we standing on? I still think it's early stage, very early stage. Uh, what do you think, consulting uh, with a lot of these companies, there are a lot of new applications and technologies that are mm -hmm. in preparation for areas of the industry that are not currently using collaborative robots. So it's still early stage. What is your answer from Sarah and uh, Sanjeev? Because both of them have heavy background on the operational as well as more uh, uh, heavy operational side. So uh, what about your comments about this? Are we good? And, um... Actually, so there's a whole set of businesses that actually can't quite afford the robotics. So that's where I have more intimate knowledge of because a lot of our clients are from there. And in heavy industries, um, but yes, in the food and beverage, I do see robotics already. Like they're carrying trays of food and everything else. So, uh, but so it always comes down to the pricing and the ROI on it. But a huge space that's been untouched is there's a lot of data from the hardware that's already in their factories today Ooh. and m managing that and um, turning that into an actionable uh, recommendation automatically is like the first step and that's still i see in early stages so if you built in complex engineering like electrical mechanical etc all in and now they're getting an actionable result. It really drives a ton of value for the COO on an everyday basis, because you see in manufacturing, they're making something every day. They're selling something every day. It's not quite a CapEx. It's not a one time done and gone. So that's where I see a ton of value and it doesn't stop. Like you can't, you can keep optimizing so many layers to optimize mm -hmm. your 
precision can get highly more and more accurate. And uh, the good part is the hardware, um, the hardware that's required, that pricing is coming down. Mm -hmm. So you've got edge computing, you've got the IoT tech stack, and as that keeps coming down, and now you have Amazon entering the market with more sensors. Uh, so it's going to augment and make the consulting that people need a lot more inexpensive. So typically that's very expensive. So you need high expensive, really a um, lot of expertise. Like for example, in oil and gas, you need a 30 year expert to tell you if a compressor is working correctly or the maintenance for that compressor. You're not gonna need that anymore. So a lot of industries just can't afford it, right? So what do you do when you can't afford it? You're just gonna deal with the inefficiency. But now you don't have to. And I say that's a huge space personally for our clients. And we love doing this every day. So thanks, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for clarifying. Sanjeev, what is your take on this? Yeah, I think uh, in addition, what Adam and Sarah mentioned. Sanjeev is uh, in the field now. He's in the field. Okay. So I just want to try to target him. Yes. Yeah. So I think some of the big challenges, you know, as of now, the manufacturing industry that we, uh, today we are facing is a uh, lot of still manual work. The data is on the paper. So it is still, you know, the checklist and all kind of uh, manual records. And even some of them have, you know, big data like ERP systems. And there are so many systems, they don't talk to each other. So one of the biggest challenges how do you bring all those technologies in a single platform and then get insights from the data? Because there is a huge data available today. That is the biggest uh, challenge. And then uh, also helping the workers and engineers, uh, really making them digital savvy in terms of understanding how these technologies work, how do we really bring that technologies uh, to a meaningful, actionable data in a way that you know they can act on the bigger problems like uh, Sarah mentioned a lot of inefficiencies exist and now we are we are we need to really identify what are the bottlenecks where our big cash flow things are just you know hidden and then where we need to really bring those technologies and bring that data available for management to act and then drive efficiency and then effectiveness accordingly that's what thanks, my, my thanks, thanks Sanjeev. Yeah, that is going to be picked up a lot I'm seeing it RPA all the stuff let me go to some of the questions to uh, Joshua. Uh, I know Joshua background is I'm a uh, Joshua background is primarily on the EV side, battery recycling. I have seen uh, even the presentation from before or even in the industry. Most of the people are talking about the software. Say, hey, is it going to be machine learning, artificial intelligence? We are talking about blockchain, other technology. Here we are many things we are talking about, but not most of the people are talking about renewable energy, which I'm seeing. Uh, let me put this way. So instead of uh, the current energy model, what is the alternative energy model? How we can recycle it? There's a lot of process in that side, which people are not focusing. Uh, what do you see? Uh, what will be the impact in the manufacturing industry, uh, Joshua, uh, especially on the uh, renewable energy source? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's obviously a ton that can be unpacked <laughs> in that conversation, right? Because there is there's so much, um, you know, from a, you know, going to my infra infrastructure standpoint. So uh, manufacturing traditionally has a much more robust electrical infrastructure. And uh, there's applications where you could put, you know, energy storage at the edge of the grid, if you will. And because the infrastructure can support that um, storage and dispatch of energy is a great example where manufacturers could leverage their infrastructure to really create renewable sources. Uh, implementing battery systems, for example, uh, not to mention the physical buildings, the amount of space right on the roof that can be implementing solar. Um, but really what a lot of the issue keeps going back to is kind of what Sarah touched on, cost. Right. So what's the ROI of, the, of putting in a million dollar energy system into your facility? How do you quantify that? How do you return that? Right. It's a great PR piece. But as an owner, when you're watching the dollars and cents and you have, you know, uh, investors and, and board of directors to be accountable to, how do you quantify that? And how do you tell a story that makes sense in the long run? And I think that's the hard thing, even with anything that we're talking about today is, is always having to have that vision for what the future could be. 
um, be willing to make the investment today, whether it's clean tech and renewable energy sources and ways to be more efficient. And obviously, mm-hmm. we talk about automation, the amount of energy savings, right? Are, are, what was like 40 some percent based on the presentation before could be saved through automation from a, you know energy consumption standpoint. Machines don't need to be running all the time. Right, we can put in better uh, motors. Right, you guys, I'm sure you guys understand what you know power factoring is, and when a motor spins up, and how much energy it consumes that initial engagement. Well, there's new motor technology out there today that's much better. So, what does that look like, and how are we implementing that? But the cost to reward is always seem to be the tension point. It, it, it really takes a commitment uh, of the owners to say we're going to move this direction. And we're going to implement these technologies because it has a long-term value. Because there is going to be an ROI. It will exist, right? We all know that. Um, I just bought an EV, for example, right? The cost to buy the EV was expensive. But now I pay 20 bucks a month to fuel my car Ooh. versus 100 and some bucks a month, right? So right. there is an ROI. It's just, are we willing to take the step forward? And I think that's the biggest tension um, as a whole. But take all that as is, and understand the technology piece, there's definitely ways to connect the intelligence, the predictive modeling, right, the AI, the ML, and really create a very, very efficient factories because industry, yeah. industry does consume a lot of energy. There's a lot of energy waste in, in, in industry, and we can definitely do a better job with that, especially with the data, the IoT um, that we can bring in and, and implement. Absolutely. Thank you. So I think uh, Sarah also mentioned the uh, same, uh, stating that a lot of uh, Hardware devices are coming to the lower cost now. So people are moving towards that model. So that is going to reduce the cost as well. And yeah. 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 Where is the noise coming from? Um, okay, now it's good. So uh, uh, important thing is big players are investing a lot. As uh, Sarah mentioned that Amazon, big players of Microsoft to Google, everyone is investing heavily on the IoT. It is one of the important. I know G is investing heavily on that one. I hear Microsoft is investing close to four billion on this one. That's what I hear. That's an important thing. But what do you what do you look what do you look for the workforce for the next ten years? Joshua, sorry, as far as uh, clean tech or energy sustainability, uh, or tech is it workforce. I'm talking about the workforce. Yeah. So um, it's very interesting. I've had conversations with um, clients in a previous life. And, you know, every time we go and we consult on automating a section of a line or implementing a robot or a cobot, uh, you know, the, the comments we get back from the floor is, oh, you're taking our jobs away. <laughs> and, but when we sit down with the actual owners, that's not the truth, right? They go, the people we have on our factory floor today, we want on our factory floor. They're loyal. They're great. You know, we will absolutely 100% invest in them, give them the training they need. Right. And so what it comes down to is I think even Henry Ford dealt with this when he started taking the process of assembling the Model A, right, and, and kept breaking it down smaller and smaller steps. And they started losing employees because, you know, one employee, all he does all day is put one bolt on. Right. It's oversimplified the process. And the reality is all of us, we want to be stimulated. And so by implementing technology and then teaching employees how to interact with that technology just creates an incredible ecosystem within the manufacturing process. And so I think... And in general, it's going to create an opportunity for one manufacturers to invest in their people and their people have an opportunity to be really involved and engaged in how things are manufactured. Because the end, these, these guys that run these lines, they they know what they're doing, right? They, they, they love it. They have a passion for it. And there's there's a lot of intelligence there that sometimes gets untapped. And investing in that is really, I think, going to be important in the future. And it's going to be really, again, driven from the top, right? Seeing that and then pushing that down and giving those opportunities. Uh, but we are talking about techies always, right? Um, but think about a little bit blue collar job, right? So what? It, because we are trying to say it is automation is going to reduce that side. All IT is all we are good, but we are trying to target that they don't. Have, they are not going to get into the tech side. They are going to upgrade themselves. So we are. We are always talk about in the corporate. Hey, upgrade yourself. Next technology, it will. You can pick up. But what about the blue collar job? Uh, who likes to take this? We are still in my perspective, especially in the manufacturing industry, which I'm trying to think of a little bit louder of how it is going to be. More robotics, I like it. Good stuff, yes. More investment, more investors. But how do you really see the change the, the real uh, people who the people? Uh, John, would you like to take a question on this side? Yeah, I would. So the blue-collar workers that we actually work with, they're excited about it. 
because they've got, just like Joshua mentioned, they've got 20 years of experience, 30 years of experience. They really, and back to what Sanjeev was saying, they don't want to write down pay, uh, numbers on paper. They really don't want to do that. They're smarter than that. They can do more than that. So uh, most recent example is we tell one of our clients now exactly at 24 hours how much product they made and how much cash they made, right? Before us, that 30 plus experienced gentleman, he had a team of lower level people and they would make mistakes and data would be stale when it gets reported to the upper management. And it was a frustrating experience for him anyways. Now having a machine doing it for him, he's super excited because he can actually drive more value for your company and you're tripling your production. He's excited that he doesn't have to hire three times more people and make three times more mistakes uh, on writing data. Saying, right? That's what I'm saying. Uh, the robotics uh, is going to take occupy some job of some blue collar work. It's They're not bad. thinking that way though. Okay. And that's, I think that's what Joshua and I are saying. It's augmenting. Our experiences, they're not thinking that way. They're smarter okay. than that. They want it, okay. is Go our ahead. experience. Go yeah, let, let, let me add a little bit on that. I think what Cher I mentioning is right. Because a lot of uh, people in manufacturing, the blue collar workers, don't want to do those heavy lifting job, fatigue job, like Adam mentioning, like cobots or robots are going to help them do their job more efficiently. They can produce more, you know, products. At the same time, it is easy for them just go, uh, you know, see the screen and then find out what exactly is happening. Okay, okay, definitely it's going to reduce the number of workers, but we can use those number of workers for the growth. We can build one more factory because you are so efficient. Now you're growing faster than what you could. And then the same worker, or maybe you can hire more workers, but I think jobs will be shifting from one type of heavy, you know, tired job to easy to do and more efficient job with all this automation. So I think in a different way, saying that, yes, there will be less worker required for the same amount of work, but there may be more worker required because you are growing. Mm, sure. Right, I, 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 I think more I intelligent and I think make and they get excited about learning more and being more intelligent. Like now they get to see engineering based so, analysis. Uh, uh, more, future more technology. I would like to take this question to John as well. John, based on the discussion, what is the future of the smart manufacturing? What is going to, how it's going to look like, John? Um, I, I think uh, what's really fascinating about uh, about um, about this is the concept of the cooperative uh, robot or cooperative factory, the cobots, um, because that uh, that means there's an interaction between the machine or the factory and the worker. Um, so we're so we're we're moving towards a situation where. Um, be using keyboards to enter information or give instructions to the to the robot right we'll be speaking to the robot uh, or, or to the machine or to the factory and the factory or the machine will be speaking back to us um, and in fact uh, for, for the worker that's 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 very enabling because they no longer need to be a, a specialist in a particular type of production process they just need to know what they want so and then the and then the machine will, will do the figuring out. So the so the machine will will also interact with the worker to find out exactly what the worker wants by asking questions. So for instance, if the if the worker or the supervisor might say to the uh, to the machine, look, uh, you know, I, I need a um, hundred units of this product uh, in the next hour, and the machine will say, oh well, I. Uh, I lost him. Are you guys able to see him? Can you hear him? I think we lost him. Yeah, right. maybe there's. We'll uh, carry on. That's so, fine. Okay. Oh, this this gives this gives the um, John. Your internet is very bad. Enormous bad. agency. Uh, you are John. you are you are cutting off a lot. Okay, John, just for information. All oh, right. Okay. Um, so um, so so this 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 gives the work a tremendous agency because he can communicate uh, he or she can communicate directly with the machine uh, or with the factory. And um, uh, and focus on their own specialty without needing to learn how to drive the machine, for instance. Thank you, thank you, John. And uh, let me move into some more interesting questions as well, technology-wise, right? What technology? See, we have we have seen uh, the, even the first presentation. We have been seeing a lot of technology 
is going to involve in the future of the factory. Right? It's going to be artificial intelligence, it may be virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, it may be on blockchain, or it may be digital twin, many things going to involve. But which technology is going to boom, um, which is going to be the primary dominator in this future of the factory? Sanjeev, uh, would you like to take this? Yeah. Uh, go okay, ahead. just uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit, you know, backstage earlier, you know, we have a lot of data, right? It, it's coming in, mm -hmm. the PLCs, the sensors, right? You name it. The reality is, in some situations, almost too much data. Uh, how do we interact with data? How do we get that information out? I think what's going to drive or what really we're going to see definitely driving the, the, the ship forward, if you will, is going to be uh, real-time data that is presented in a way that is actionable and measurable. Um, that's what, and, and, unif, and unif, unifying the data, right, from different, you know, proprietary platforms into a single uh, location. So I think it's going to be one of the major next steps as far as Industry 4.0 is just actionable, yeah, real-time. Yeah. Data. I like the term actionable data. That is very important because uh, even if you talk about any data which is actionable, that's what you are uh, really getting the benefit. I, I think uh, Sarah also mentioned the point uh, how uh, more realistic real-time optimization perspective. I see. Uh, Adam, do you like to add any points on that? Yes. Yeah. So it's very interesting. There's been a lot of talk about uh, usability of data within a company, and and that's very important. What I see, though, as a big current issue and one that is going to uh, uh, improve a lot and change and being driven by is this new blockchain technology, which I've spent quite a bit of time studying. So right now, everybody along the entire supply chain or even, let's say, the value chain from raw material all the way up to the end customer, uh, all those interactions along the way, thousands of them, right? The quality control inspection report, when something's shipped, when something's received, when it's paid for, those are all on individual computer systems for the most part. There's not transparency and connectedness. It can take weeks sometimes to trace a bad batch of quality. I see Sanji shaking his head. He probably knows that too, right? You're trying to figure out where along that process was there a problem. Blockchain technology is way more than... Bitcoin is what you hear a lot about, but it's really a worldwide computer network that you can have set up for people to access privately along your entire supply chain or value chain where everybody has instant access to every bit of data that you enter there along the way. And you can check exactly when something shipped. And that blends with what's called smart manufacturing, which are things like the RFID tags and other things that help you trace uh, where everything is that all gets tied into a blockchain. And really the word blockchain just means another block of information is created and it's cryptographically protected so that you have privacy. Um, and there are some companies like IBM uh, that are building these for companies now. And then there's, there's sort of more public ones you can tie into um, you know, you buy the token store and things like that. So everybody tying into blockchain and that transparency and instant uh, travel of information across but, all the different players is going to have a huge think impact. think blockchain is going to increase the cost of it? Because we are talking about technology, one side is going to reduce the cost. But if you talk about blockchain, there's a server, a lot of servers are needed, which is going to increase the cost of it. So how it is matching here? Because you need more computation. Blockchain, one of the disadvantage current term is, uh, current trend is more computation right. needed for the process, right? So how are you going to tackle that? View? Right. Well, I mean, first Maybe. of all, I'm not uh, an expert in in the hardware IT side of it, but what I can say is the cost efficiencies would have to by far outweigh the hardware in place. Now, in terms of the actual mm -hmm. hardware, there are companies mm -hmm. that have server farms and you essentially rent time on them. So each company does not have to have a huge IT department and its own warehouses okay. of servers, right? You kind of use what you need. So I think it really, you can customize it cost-wise to what you're able to, to handle, but net-net, it's going to reduce costs and that'll be part of the adoption drive. So, yeah, if I can jump in ahead. on that, you know, um, I was just reading a bit on blockchain and manufacturing even yesterday and the GM was brought up as an example where they had a recall and the amount of months it took for them to identify exactly mm -hmm. the source, 
right along the supply chain that caused that. And granted, they have, you know, their just in time platforms and all their, you know, tier one, two or tier two, three, four, right? Suppliers are required to um, submit to that. But even then, it's still like months to identify mm -hmm. when, where, how, right? And so blockchain has the potential, really not maybe not small batch manufacturing or process manufacturing, but more large scale, you know, operations to really simplify the process and save hundreds of millions of dollars in a simple, mm -hmm. you know, single recall situation. So I think it's going to be more on the large scale applications oh. blockchain really should be implemented. What other technology you guys see here is going to be boom? I know operational side, there's a lot of technology. AR, VR, yeah, I think I can, I can, I can, uh, you know, just share some information that I know I'm using currently are like vision technologies, right? Vision systems are going to be more and more used on inspecting parts and, you know, finding issues and then also tracing back, you know, what exactly happened. Like, you know, using artificial intelligence, you can really go back time and then really find out what happened. And that is also, and also you can, you know, catch the operator moment, etc. There are so many companies now coming up with this kind of technologies that is on Boom, and some companies are utilizing. Again, still we need to prove on ROI. What Shera was mentioning because sure. ROI is very high uh, for those uh, where you know you have a tremendous huge volume opportunity, but wherever ROI is not there, then you need to really think about different technologies. Yeah. Sure. Also, I, I, I think if we're if we're talking about the new new technologies, which are really um, are going to be game changers. One of them is uh, the 4D uh, printing, which uh, um, which was mentioned earlier. Um, all the all the the supply chain issues we're having now in the geopolitics mean that the supply chain is going to be shrunk, so it's going to be as local as possible. And mm -hmm. and 4D printing at the local level gives us uh, gives a factory the opportunity to source locally. So. A much much more of the production will be local rather than um, than a, a global supply chain such as what we have now. Um, and 4D printing is uh, by itself uh, can replace a lot of the of the mass manufacturing um, facilities which are centrally located and which supply the entire world. Sure, good. Sort of. You have any points on that technology wise? You are on mute. Uh... No, no, you are on mute. No, I do, I do. Uh, so for me, it's actually, I believe it would be AR and machine learning technologies because the more data, like as Joshua had mentioned, there was, there's a lot, there's a data overload. There is a lot of data and a lot of history. And with really tight machine learning algorithms, you can start to predict and forecast your operations. Mm -hmm. And then like AR and, you know, what if you could, give that simulated background and that visual for your blue collar workers exactly. to easily yeah. identify. I think that's going to be a big space. Yeah, I think uh, from my perspective, it has been a lot of echo. Uh, I don't know where it's from. Uh, so uh, definitely from my standpoint, uh, artificial intelligence, especially data is going to be a huge impact in the future of the factory. The second thing I'm seeing more blue collar job focus of AR VR, which is going to help a lot because we have been doing for multiple customers it's really eliminating a lot of dependency of uh, spending a lot of time with the multiple people. So you don't need to wait for some export to come and do all that side is helping. But uh, still, how you guys are looking for it? Uh, we are talking about all different technology, AI, yeah, we are all it's good, looks good, no question. But what about the security of it? Do you think the future of the factory will get impacted by the future security also? Because I don't think so, all relevant to IOD. Currently, all the new technology we are talking about, end of the day, manufacturing side belongs to the IoT area. So, how the security aspects? Uh, who would like to take this question, Sanjeev? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so one of the again, like you mentioned, security is a big thing, and now we have so many systems, right? And then also, I think in mind, the future of the factory includes cyber security is also one of the part of the future of the factory, right? Correct. Because in your all the technology it should be part of it so what is the move in the future yeah go ahead yeah like like abhilash mentioned in terms of you know uh trust zero right we always need to go from there right oh we we have to really think about okay how we are going to protect it and then assume that okay in in spite of whatever you have there's always so many people right i think i heard uh maybe every 10 seconds there is a hacker who is going to really go and then attack a system. So it is, how do you protect from all those is a big question. 
now with iot and machine learning all systems connected if there is a very very uh, you know a big attack and if there is a downtime the factory then everything will be lost for for maybe months or maybe you know you never know so that's how how do you secure the information how do you connect each other and then even there is a downtime how fast we can recover all those are the challenges of the future so i think that will be a big big uh, thing for our manufacturing in the future that's where i think technologies need to emerge and i'm not an expert on the cyber security but i definitely think that would be a big challenge for everyone who, uh, thanks thanks and who like to touch that area security area please go down so uh blockchain is is going to have a lot to do with cybersecurity it is an increasingly important issue absolutely uh blockchain has several uh sort of firewalls if you will one of it is the course the trend is toward distributed computing so you don't have one single server in one company that somebody can can hack into very easily right it's it'll be distributed around the world multiple servers the other is it's it's cryptographically uh secure that makes it more difficult as well and then you also have node validators you have uh different inputs of uh, people who are participating in the blockchain that are validating the transactions and so yes have there been some hacks yes but it's much more difficult bitcoin the most famous one has never been hacked in the whole 12 years of its existence and i'm sure people have tried so blockchain is actually going to be a a security enhancer I agree because uh, yeah. even I talked about this almost four years before. The one of the security aspect of uh, blockchain is not only for cryptocurrency side; it's for IoT side as well. The blending of IoT and blockchain is going to create a big impact in the industry. Especially 5G is the root cause of all this change, which I believe strongly because of you get more bandwidth network. The technologies are easily evolving. Uh, that also I'm seeing parallelly. Uh, I'm expecting yeah, more. Yeah. Sorry, this is Abhi. Uh, I do have a couple of uh, viewpoints on this one. Um, if uh, you're not passing on to the next one yet, on the cyber security, okay. yeah, on the cyber security side, uh, I, I think we have ample examples even without the proliferation of uh, all the IoT and IoT devices, right? So, for instance, if we go back and look at what happened with. Uh, uh target or one of the leading agencies in the past almost about 7 years back their hvac systems were compromised and that is how they've been able to put malware and everything into their systems right so now every device every connected device or even uh, a mobile device that is going to be connected to a sensor or something like that everything is a point of entry uh for hackers now right so it is going to the the vulnerability aspect for smart factories is going to be blowing out of proportions um even statistically i think uh, in the last uh, couple of years itself more than 30% of uh, um uh, factories or uh, you know manufacturing units have gotten hacked so even as of today as we speak those measures are not yet in place now we cannot expect to put the same kind of security that you you think about for for your laptops and computers to iot devices right it has to be a lot more pervasive and that is where we need to look at uh, a little bit of more layered security right so for instance we talked about the zero trust security which is uh, at a network layer where even before somebody gets into your network even before the initial step in happens we are uh, uh, the technology is able to actually identify whether it's a valid uh, request or not and this happens happens for every packet right and you can actually latch on these uh, zero trust devices uh, like blue armor or things like those onto the iot sensors or onto the hubs and things like those so you can make it either a software driven or a hardware driven right so th- those are going to be extremely important in the future and going one more level if your network is compromised then your uh, self uh, um, resilient networks those are going to be some very very important things because you cannot expect to wait for uh, to react or bring the network down those networks have to resolve themselves as well and more importantly the third layer if you look at it data right now anybody you needs to use the data even if you keep the data encrypted anybody needs to use the data 
there is going to be a small window of time where the data will be decrypted. Otherwise, you cannot read what the data is. Machines do not understand that part of it, right? So this concept of the fully homomorphic encryption, where data and in transit data at rest is going to be encrypted 24 by 7. You can do all your operations on encrypted data. That is going to be a huge game changer, whether it is machine reading a data or a person reading a data or even an, uh, an AI hacker using an AI solution who's trying to get the data. He won't be able to understand what the data is because it is completely encrypted. So fully homomorphic encryption and technologies like those at the data level are going to be a huge game changer. Thanks. Thanks. Let's go on to the quick question on our all the four point right? especially op operations optimization of the maintenance right how you can increase the real time productivity especially a proactive decision uh, and you can increase your roi as well uh, that's because the industry 4.0 is going to be a very major player right that's what people are expecting to go uh, sarah do you would like to take it yeah so um I have a very different perspective on the whole IoT maintenance thing because there is like a ton of predictive maintenance startups, ton of them uh, on the market today. I think it needs to be more intelligent. And there's a reason why our uh, COOs don't get super excited about it. Mm -hmm. It's because like if they look across their operations and today's predictive maintenance says, oh yeah, all thousand pumps need to be maintained. You know, they're coming up for their schedule, whatever that is. But really, all thousand pumps are not connected to the highest cash flow play, uh, value. And there is a dollar to maintain and send people to do the maintenance activities for all thousand pumps. But the real value for that maintenance and keeping it online comes when you can identify, because when we when you look, when our CEO looks at it, there's only really 10 pumps that are associated with 80% of his cash flow for today. And if he has a limited amount of budget, that's where he needs to focus his um, resources on or cash or people, whatever it is. And today that is not given to him on a turnkey basis to do, to get that analysis. His people still have to do it. Like engineers have to do it, the blue collar person has to put eyes on it, et cetera. So that process needs to be automated. And I think that's where the true value of predictive maintenance and keeping it online comes in. Like that's our opinion from what we see on the market. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so much. I will just add oh, a little bit on that. Uh, again, what Shara is mentioning is there is a Probably everybody knows Pareto principle, 80-20. You no, know, because 80-20 uh, principle says that you know you need to really focus your resources, energies on those 20% where you are going to get 80% impact on the result, right? That's where the the analogy is 80-20 principle. So you need to always focus on uh, the right things in order to get the right output. You, you know, I, I think the factor of the future, if you're looking 10 years ahead. Um, predictive maintenance uh, will be something of the past. You know, I, I, I think that the, the the factory will be self-maintaining. It's like if you launch a spacecraft, right? It's not going to be a a blue collar um, um, a technician going to going to go out there and fix something. Uh, the spacecraft is self uh, healing, if you like. And um, I think that uh, that that all all machines uh, in a factory in ten years' time, and in fact, the entire factory will be self-healing. You know, it'll diagnose problems, it'll it'll anticipate them, and it'll fix them without any human interaction whatsoever. But maybe what it will do is advise advise the manager, hey, I've just fixed a process so and so, or uh, but I don't think there'll be very much uh, a human interaction in that because because so many autonomous machines now. Um, are self uh, self maintaining, if you like, especially ones which uh, go to space or underwater, for instance. You know, there are all sorts of applications. That's def that technology will definitely be in the factory in the future. But John, somebody need to really go and do those work, right? So even the machine can give you the indication, but there will be a required worker or technician who need to go and do that work in order to fix the problem. I don't but think so. The, I, I, the I, I point think what is making, uh, Sanjeev, is a what percentage? 
do I need to do a lot or it's going to be 25%? That's what John Point. Go ahead, John, please. Go ahead, John. Yep. Uh, Joshua, do you like to pitch on this point? Optimization, especially I'm very interested in the EV side, what he's focusing on, I'm, because that is going to be a lot of future. <laughs> yeah, it is. So, yeah, I think so. Obviously, everything happens in phases. So, so on one hand, there is a physical, there's, there's, a, there's a chasm between the physical and the digital, right? Mm -hmm. So it's one thing for to develop AI or ML that has the ability to do predictive modeling and then provide the data back to somebody to respond to that, right? I got a motor that's running hotter than it should, so I need to go figure out why, right? I got a, a relay that's not firing quite right, right? So that, that requires a physical response. And so, unfortunately, there's just the, like the chasm. And, and at some point in the future, yeah, there would be, you know, the machines would have the ability to say, all right, I already have a robot at this machine, and I know I can replace Relay 7 if I have to, for example, right? Uh, but there's always going to have to be some dynamic or some touching of the physical components between the you know, digital and the, and the hardware. And I think that's where we're going to see that transition. The predictive modeling for potential failure really is a, is a way to try to anticipate downtime, which goes back to what Sarah mentioned, right, cash flow. So if I lose a machine because a motor is overheating and it's been overheating for a month, I just didn't know about it. And then our machine's down for a week because I got to go find a new motor to replace it, right? That's a lot of money. And and that's what the, it goes back to the, the 80-20 rule, right? How are we identifying the critical points of failure within our manufacturing process? How do we quantify that from a monetary standpoint? And how do we classify that and then respond accordingly? Um, that's where the, the ML AI predictive modeling mm -hmm. piece starts to come in to where I look at my factory floor and go, okay, I got a high risk on these three machines. Uh, how am I going to respond or start preparing myself now to respond when that becomes an issue? And it, what's my ROI? So when I'm held accountable to my stakeholders, I can quantify that data and say, this is why we respond the way we are. Um, and I think that's where the predictive modeling piece starts really start to get interesting is being able to anticipate what's going to happen. And then it goes back to, you know, we already have in a lot of industries, you know, scheduled downtimes. So coordinating, right, to schedule downtimes instead of in the middle of high production. And so it just requires looking ahead to the future, really, is what it boils down to. And getting that data, again, going back again, the data, understanding the data, and then responding to it as appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, ben, ben, I, I think that um, um, on that topic, the, the, the machines will be, it's, it's all the design of the machines. The machines were designed and built not to fail. Uh, you know, I, I, I can remember cars that uh, were unreliable uh, in the past, etc. But now a car is extremely reliable. Right? They, they, they all virtually never fail. Oh, so, it's evolving. And, and, it's, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's the same for, you know, if you launch a mission into space or an, an, an underwater drone, for instance, it's designed to not fail. Because if it fails, it's the end of the mission. So it's designed to not fail. And I'm sure that thinking, that kind of design thinking, is going to go into the into factory machines as well, so that there won't be failures. You know, the machine won't be overheating, well, because it'll be designed to not overheat. To some extent, right? Because a lot of machines, like in space and underwater, also have redundancy. Right? Airplanes have multiple redundant systems, but manufacturers, if you're running a very lean manufacturing operation, you're not going to create multiple levels of redundancy. Uh, for example, I did a project where we redesigned a, uh, a control system, replacing old Allen Bradley PLC five for a roller coaster. Right. Every roller coaster has to have two to three redundant safety systems and control systems running simultaneously because it's a roller coaster. Um, but in manufacturing uh, something that makes a glass cup, right, I don't need redundancy. So that's where I think the depends on the criticalness of the application to how much needs to be invested to create redundancy. So if there's a potential component failure, the system keep running despite the fact. And what, just to add to what Joshua was saying, what I've seen is if the component failure cost is cheap, they are going to let it fail. They might, they're like, okay, just tell me when it will fail and <laughs> we'll have someone standing by to swap it out. And it's amazing. Some of the things I hear, they go, yeah, we know it's going to fail. We're pushing it to the max. You know, it's because the product it's making is worth that day. 10 times more than replacing that component. I was going to say, I mean, in it. terms of maintenance, if we move away from uh, the... Adam and John, uh, just one oh, minute, sorry. one minute. I would like to take one question because we are running out of time. Uh, quickly on uh, Clyde A. Jones uh, asked a question, how technology create 
more human service which does not replace humans? It's a very interesting question. <laughs> Reverse way, I see that. Anyone wants to take this question before we continue the discussion? I, I would say we need engineers to design systems that can repair themselves, that can write the code to figure that out, right? We need engineers to design the robots and the relays that won't fail. And so uh, it's really moving, if you will, from the blue collar mentality to now being intelligent and being involved in designing all the intelligence needed to make the systems manufactured. So I think that's where the transition happens, right? We're moving away from, you know, making fires out in the woods now to having stoves that do that for us in our houses, right? That's the same type of transition where we're physically making the parts. Now we make the machines, engineering the machines that make the parts. And I think that's really where the, the shift's going to take place. What about Adam and John? What do you believe on this one? I, I yeah, well, ask well, oh, go ahead, John. Yeah. I no, no. I was just going to say that um, uh, that well, just as Joshua just mentioned, I I, I think that it's it's uh, it's all in the design of the machine. The machines are going to be designed to not fail. Um, I, I know it sounds a little bit strange at this point, but um, uh, even if you just look at the at cars, you know, the the electric car has got so fewer moving parts and, and than than an internal combustion car. So the electric car won't fail anywhere near as often as um, as a, an internal combustion uh, vehicle. So I think that kind of thinking is going to go into the factory as well. So um, so uh, any failure is going to be very ex is is expensive, especially if it's on a critical path. So I think failure is going to be designed out not not perfect, right? Because it's it's not a perfect world, but as close to perfect as possible. Sure, Adam, please. Yeah. In terms of the question about technology and whether it loses jobs or creates jobs, anyone can look throughout history. Every industrial technology revolution, does it cause disruption? Yes. Does it cause displacement of people? Yes. But net, net, yes. it has always created more jobs than it's destroyed. True. I mean, I'm sure there's less people, I don't, I don't mean to sound facetious, there's less people making candles because of light bulbs, right? There's less people making buggy whips because of automotive. But there's still a lot more people working today than there was, you know, during the Industrial Revolution. And this has always been the case. I don't see that changing in the future. Um, and one other quick thing I wanted to mention about uh, maintenance. We're talking a lot about the hardware side of maintenance, you know, changing the spark plug or something. But a lot of uh, maintenance is going to become uh, digital over the cloud. So what I see, say, with collaborative robots, uh, as well as uh, electric cars like Tesla, uh, update other types of maintenance to the software is more and more going to be done from a central location over the cloud down into thousands of the receivers around the world, whether it's a software or uh, firmware updates and fixes. Or edge-based, edge-based uh, well, evolution of edge is really going well uh, because of 5G and seeing a lot. Cool, cool. Uh, uh, we'd like to a little bit uh, go on. Um, who uh, I know this is a fact factory of the future for manufacturing industry. In this group, who will raise the hand? Say the factory of the home. Okay. <laughs> future. Okay. Who would like to make your home hundred percent automation? Who will say yes for this? Oh, oh definitely. Okay. Absolutely, yes. You know, I mean, a anybody who uh, is a fan of Star Trek uh, uh, has seen the uh, the Star Trek uh, replicator. I think that would be perfect. You know, if you could just say, "Hey, computer, uh, coffee black," and there it is. Uh, I think that's the ultimate uh, that uh, that we would be aiming for. Why? Why, is uh, Adam, why did you raise your hand? What is the reason? I, you know, for a part of the vision of Trading on our company is we want to turn essentially homes and buildings uh, into energy producers rather than consumers. And I think that's where a big part of the energy side where we can really bring the distributed technology we're talking about, uh, bring that capability down to that level and really robust our electrical grid and manage, and be, you know, deliver sustainability at that point. Um, and that's a big passion for what we're doing is, is bringing that, changing that uh, diagram or uh, uh, paradigm. Why, why Sarah and uh, Sanjeev didn't raise the hand? What is the reason? You don't like it? Do no, I, I need it. In fact, I, I, I just, uh, you know, I'm thinking 
like you know we have so much of things now i can control my garage door from my phone i can do so many things i can switch on lights i can switch on project or anything so i'm i'm a big fan of technology but same time i'm also uh, you know trying to really be conscious about how much do i use because sometimes this is like a crazy thing you go on using it and then it is always distracting because of notification and all so that's where the balance uh, i think we need to think about the future otherwise everything will be done by machines and your health and everything will be going in a different direction so how do you balance that is my my question <laughs> okay. We um, hand as well. We we've all grown through, uh, you know, the experience where we used to have to dictate a letter to our secretaries, and she would type it up, and we would go back and forth five or six times before the letter uh, said what we wanted to really have it say. And of course, the topic left. It was last week's topic, not today's topic. Let alone. this minute topic so we have learned how to type our own emails they may sound like such a boring topic for the, today's discussion but it is the life that we've gone through and how it's affected what was an industry and what is in our life because yes we'll sit there we'll write an email and it's gone and we've taken care of business if we can do the same with knowing where our kids are or that the security of our home is is taken care of because we know that the lights are on we know that our family is safe i'm all for the technology as long as it doesn't do what you had just warned that we're staring at our phone and not our families but if it's for the safety for the convenience it's for allowing us to be well all of us are in the same place and we haven't left our homes that's cool that's a good thing Uh, so as long as we are using human judgment on what's right for us and not get wrapped up in the uh, convenience and so the not what 100% we are going to be watching the movie wall um <laughs> yeah i i'm a very simple person so for me in my home i always think about well if i had a model that could predict my uh, power usage so i know exactly what i can what i should spend okay. and bill before, before you complete your comment uh, sara all of you really uh, educated the people go for more automation okay carefully about your words go ahead okay <laughs> yeah and then i always think about if there was a program in my fridge that could tell me like what ingredients i had available and to tell me recipes that would be amazing so you know it would save me from going to the store <laughs> or if it actually told me what to order from the grocery store and had it delivered like you know and i give it a 100 dollar a day budget or whatever budget it is and you know it just i mean, uh yeah so those are a few things i think about <laughs> and when is the right time to run what the right time to walk to run your washer and dryer yeah. is there a cheaper time versus a more expensive time who cares run it during the cheaper time and run it for me why not so <laughs> great so great thank you so much i think i crossed the time already uh thank you so much for all of your contribution and well share the information thought process as well adam sara uh, john joshua and uh, uh, sanjeev nik thank you so much uh nitin please take it from here and thank you all of your time thank you thank you chitray and all the guys i think it was a lovely lovely panel discussion i loved it panel discussion always creates a lot of values and a lot of things comes up and i see abhi and nick joining in the panel discussion to give their thoughts as well i think that's what make a panel discussion very exciting thanks a lot guys every one of you take care and we'll connect to you all in the future as well So we'll quickly move on to our next presenter for the day uh, as we are exactly on time. Susan Lance Printel is their founder, president and CEO, Sir Clean. May we have you on stage, Susan? Her topic is MRO of the future. Susan is there? We'll just wait one minute for Susan. Maybe she was having some technical difficulty in connecting. Susan, are you there? Yeah. I am here. Okay. Um, I am trying to 
And can you hear me? Yes. That was, that was one Sorry. of the things that was happening before. So yes, yes. Um, is my presentation up? Uh, we cannot see your presentation. Okay, I shared the screen, but yes. Is it up now? No, Suzanne, we cannot see that. So what we can do, Suzanne, is uh, we will try to share your presentation as you are facing some technical difficulties so that we are on time. OK, I'm so sorry. I am really trying. It's just sure, sure. very, uh, the internet keeps going down and up, down and up. <laughs> I know, I know. So you can just start introducing yourself, Susan. In the meanwhile, we'll just try to pull up your presentation and we'll share it. It's there now. Yeah, your presentation is coming. This is your presentation, Susan. Can you see that? Yeah, that is the um, abstract that I had sent to you, but my slides are not up. Okay. Can we'll you try see that? We'll try that. Is it there now? Uh, we cannot sh see your screen sharing, uh, Suzanne. We can see you, but it's okay. We will try to pull out. In the meanwhile, what you can do is you can introduce yourself. What do you do? What your company does? You can start with that. And in the meanwhile, we'll pull out. Okay. Um, I'm Susan Sprentel, and I am the founder and CEO of Circlean Inc. And Circlean is a spin out of technology that was developed by American Laser Enterprises. And today with the topic of the uh, factory of the future, I was going to take you a little bit in history through automotive and where lasers played in automotive and where we're going outside the norm of what really could be considered um, a maintenance repair operations center of the future or um, in various industries that you wouldn't think as manufacturing. Sure, sure, Suzanne. So, uh, Suzanne, uh, can you share your presentation? We don't have that. Uh, you have not shared with us. Um, okay, I thought I did, but um, can you just tell me where I went wrong? Um, I went, clicked, and I'm sharing. It's telling me there. Now is it sharing? Yes. Great. Okay. I'll bring up the PowerPoint all the way. Yes. Thank you so much for your patience. No issues. No issues. It happens. You can put yourself in the presentation mode. Yeah. Great. Am... Okay. So as I stated, I'm Susan Sprentall, and we're talking about where the technology has been and where it's going. So when the automotive industry first got their start, they thought automation was looking at these lines and doing the picks and the pulls as they assembled our horseless carriages uh, in the early 1900s. In the early 1900s, there was a lot of things that were developed. But if you look at the manufacturing floors today, you're going to see all of these autonomous robotics, cars going down their slides, 
and everything is operating 24-7 um, and in some cases with total lights out operations where the engineers are using their iPads. Now, lasers played a big part in the manufacturing sector, and that's really where all of us have our experience. But we're looking at what can we take away from the automotive market and apply them in other markets and make them just as technology advanced. One of the problems that we see out in the industry is that sandblasting, grip blasting, chemical use, all of this is being done and it's not sustainable. In fact, it's very hazardous, it's very harmful for our environment. And as you can see in the pictures, how the people have to dress. And this also contributes to the hazmat problems that we have. The other challenges that we see out there and one of the things that's really big right now is our infrastructure. This happens to be one of our Navy ships and what it looks like being totally corroded. And when you have corrosion, you see that your paint and everything fails and all of this ends up in our waters that's impacting our ecosystem and downgrading the wildlife and fisheries that are growing in the Atlantic and Pacific. Again, here's how the operators have to go. And this is what the inside of a lot of your cruise lines and your container ships and railroad cars under bridges is going to be looking like. So we got our start by working with the United States Air Force and they started looking at off aircraft wing parts and how they could strip the paint with lasers and make it automated. They went to university and had university um, develop a special robotic arm and our team actually worked with them on the laser processing of taking an existing CO2 laser and moving it to a um, gantry system so that they could add the scanner. And then on the other side, you'll see where it's a robotic arm reaching out to do an F-16 nose cone on fiberglass. So as you, whoops. And here's just kind of a, an idea of where laser ablation is actually going and where we're using the automation. This is actually in a laboratory in um, Michigan, but where we started proving out the processes that we can take light and that energy of light and strip it down to the bare metal without doing any thermal distortion to the background. This is paint and primer on one of the skins. And you can see when it was processing without our laser process control sensor, it left a lot of the black paint on the yellow primer. But with our sensor technology, we can now control where we remove um, the coatings just down to the primers. And if you can stay with your primers, you can, that's the most um, improved way for your um, substrates. And lasers love rust. They remove that rust and put a nice texture in it. It removes grease. Um, a lot of your dirt, debris, barnacles, um, and things like that. And you can tell it's 3D. It's going down inside those holes and cleaning out all of that dirt and debris as they're scanning back and forth. And this is all just using light. So instead of having these chemical processes and things like that, we can go on and move from there. Now, I talked about the LPC sensor. This LPC sensor, as everyone was talking about how many sensors are, are getting into our devices, but it's actually seen. It's using what they call a LIBS technology. And this LIBS technology has thumbprints of every type of item, just like we do on our periodic table in chemistry. So we can teach and learn this sensor for what we want to remove and what we want to leave on. And as the light is hitting that surface, 
it's actually vaporizing. It's it's uh, debonding that paint to the primer, and the vacuum system is sucking it back up through the plasma and just incinerating it, changing all of its chemical compounds and making it non-hazardous and that it can actually be thrown in a lo local garbage receptacle. Now, some of the things that we've done, we've talked about the LPC sensor. Some of you mentioned, um, you know, the controls and the programming and your ability through the Internet of Things to go in. Same thing with this sensor. As we do updates, we'll actually push that out over the web. There's other tools that we can actually install in the beam path so that we can actually see if these optical lenses and things like that are um, damaged or dirty and impacting the actual performance. With different types of products, you have to have a different type of laser and you have to have a different type of beam delivery. There is not one laser coating removal system or one laser that can do all processes across the board. So as we go forward, we do need the optio, optio electronic engineers, the mechanical engineers, and we need technicians that are trained on how to operate the machine and make sure that they're not going outside of the parameters, be able to monitor that teach and learn and be able to do those things. We've developed things for the bridge market so that if they're working on the infrastructure, they can they can put it on their shoulder and just do like they did with sandblasting. And then we said this was coming soon, but it's actually out. This is a high power eight kilowatt laser chiller cool generator and the SMR optic. Um, this unit can go anywhere out in the field, and we can also put it with a cobot. Um, we can put a robot inside the trailer if they want to do something for um, field maintenance on pipelines, on your um, electrical grids where they have the covers that you see that need to be repaired. And we're building bigger models so that when they're actually out under the bridges, uh, more and more people can work on the bridge and get in and out in a lot of fewer time. Now, we don't do all this by ourselves. Um, our expertise is in the beam delivery system. So in those automotive pictures, you can tell where there was robotic welding, um, what we call scanner welding, cutting. Um, and then the big thing now in automotive is uh, pre-treat, pre-clean before you laser weld. Um, so laser technology has come a long, long way. Um, and these are just some of the manufacturers that we currently work with. These things are all off the shelf and every one of these manufacturers are joining in the Internet of Things in the uh, manufacturing 4.0. A lot of the diagnosis, just as you were talking about in the other, they can get in through the Internet and um, download additional functions, um, troubleshoot to find out which diodes or things like that may have gone wrong um, and get our customers back up on the floor. There's also the other parts of the system that goes with it. And whenever you're out in the field, you want to make sure that you're using clean air, not just compressed air, because the internal optics, the internal um, cooling mechanisms and things like that can't have any contamination to get in. So dryers and things like that are very important. By working with KUKA uh, systems, which is now called uh, Skyne Integrated Systems, and here recently they just were purchased by Advanced Integrated Technologies. They helped us get our start, and we were able to use their lab and have access to all of these different um, kinds of lasers, different powers of lasers, 
and be able to look at how we can improve our product um, and do a lot of trials and application development with our um, potential customers. They've also promoted us at very industry trade events and um, helped establish some credibility for our new company. We've had third party tests done on everything that we've done, the particulate study, which is very important for the um, Clean Air Act and things like that are going on and the metallurgy studies to make sure that we're not actually changing any of the tensile strength of any of these alloys or metals. Um, and in doing so, we've actually found on corrosion, there is a tri-biological uh, film that's actually formed that is very small in microns that inhibits corrosion from going down into those metals. We're validated by um, the Michigan Department of Transportation, the uh, NRL, Navy Research Lab. We've got a letter of support from Hill Air Force Base and their laser coating uh, removal efforts. We were a member of Clean Tech, and our sustainability study actually showed that we are um, less than 2% uh, of our products in the laser industry as a whole goes into the landfill um, when they just compare it to media blasting and high pressure water blasting. If they got into the chemicals and things like that and put it on the chart, we wouldn't show at all. Uh, it would be a zero. So as we look at our planes and our trains, our automobiles, our bridges, our ships and pleasure craft, we're seeing that there are lots of opportunities to automate with some of the new robotics that are coming out and install laser ablation. This is just one more showing of how there is just some of the um, uh, surface rust that comes on in between manufacturing stations of ships and things like that. So in order to have great adhesions, you want to be able to have the, the laser actually running pretty well. And you can see how fast it goes. This particular uh, movie was done by Trump, uh, one of the world's largest manufacturers of laser systems. They get into cutting, welding, uh, drilling, just about anything that uh, you want in, in your factory floor. So this one is where we're currently working very hard. Um, we're looking at all the maintenance and repair operations centers as part of the blue economy and the international maritime operations of cleaning up the sea. Um, Europe is really pushing very, very hard for this. So we're looking at um, how can we go in and really automate some of the functions that they do. And one of the, the first things they do in submarine shipbuilding is they're going to go in and sandblast all of the various components of the ship and make sure that they are down to the area. So we can do autonomous robotics that have forward path programming and be able to use these lift mechanisms to coordinate where this robot's going to go and get it down and start not only removing the surface rust, but texturizing that surface so that it will be ready for any welding or paint or primer um, that they may want to do at the next station. And then if you look at this one, um, this is where we would utilize KUKA to be able to go in. Um, six sensors would look at a big ship that is in the dock. They put their sensors in motion. Um, that would go back to the robots, tell them when they can start doing 
the uh, depaint process. So here you see that they're staging. Here you can see this, the sensor arms that are going to look and position where the boat is. All of this will go back into CAD data, um, kind of digital format, so that uh, the robots can, can precisely get into their place. So after they get everything done, um, they're going to go back out and switch their end effectors. And they're going to actually take inspection of what they just did to see if it's actually ready. All of this data is going to be collected into a central station so that they can use it to compare if we would go in and uh, like now we're doing the welding so they know where all of the defects are. They can go in and make those repairs um, with the same using the same robots uh, on the same autonomous system. Here they can go in and actually inspect and um, look at some processes after this. And it's, we've actually have an application doing bits and pieces of this um, overseas in um, Abu Dhabi or Dubai. I can't reach, remember just exactly which one it was. But um, now they're coming back in, everything passed its inspection, and they're going to start putting on the new coding. And by using the ro robots and automating this, you're not getting different thicknesses of your paint layers. And that's really important as we go into um, looking at fuel economies and uh, things like that. So after this is all done, um, everything is cured, it's ready to go. They'll do a final inspection. And all of this data then is going to be um, uploaded into a central system so that they can do predictive analytics and know when to bring this ship in again for planned maintenance instead of unplanned maintenance because of the corrosion. This is an area that's really impacting our Navy here in the, in the U.S. Um, a lot of the maintenance and things that they're doing is unplanned, and so it leaves us very vulnerable with our uh, fleets when they have to, and it's costly, costs us a lot of money. If you do a comparison of laser versus sandblasting, in the beginning, laser is going to be your higher cost, just as uh, the example that was given with the electric automobile. You pay more up front, but over the life of the equipment, your savings is going to be tremendous. One of the reasons why is that with sand grip blasting, um, just the components itself that you have to replace in the equipment is very expensive over time. And there is several um, damaged spots. And then putting this equipment out in the field, OSHA requires that you have a cleaning station. So there's that. You have to have uh, all of these generators and the generators are running off of diesel fuel. You have to have safety operators. You have to have two people go in in their air containment. So there is just a lot of things that take place that are going to impact this overall cost. With laser, you can go in, you have um, your safety area that you'll curtain off where you're working. All they need for safety devices is going to be laser goggles. So this is our latest. Um, this has come about because of your big box stores and everyone is trying to reduce their overall cost. They want guarantees on the paint systems. We've worked with Sherwin-Williams in the maritime industry, and they did some tests with the CirClean product, cleaning down to the bare metal and putting in what we call surface roughness um, because it's a different look than what your sandblast is going to do. 
and they repainted our samples. Um, before they did that, they took a, a particulate study of them and we didn't wrap them special or anything. We did the laser ablation. We took them off of our um, stand and put them back in their crate and sent them off. So they weren't really protected from any particulate, but they were 98% uh, clean with no contaminant on it. So they went ahead and painted them. They aged them as if they were on a ship impacted by salt water for over seven years. And then they did uh, what they call an adhesion test. The standard for the painters to uh, pass their paint inspection is 485 PSI. Our product went to 1400 PSI and the probe that was glued to the surface that was taking the measurements, it was the glue bod that failed and not the paint. So because these box stores um, are getting requests for their paint to last 10 years, if they use high pressure water jet blast, it gets into the concrete block and degrades that block and the cement that's holding it together. If they get into sandblasting or grit blasting, it's even worse. And then you have all of the big mess. So then they wanted, they went to chemicals uh, so that they can get down into the pores without any damage to the concrete, but that's very labor intensive. Uh, they have, only a few days to actually get in and out on these bridges. So they came to us and asked about laser. And this suitcase uh, is a military grade suitcase. It's watertight, airtight. It contains a air cooler for the laser. It contains a rack laser. And then in the top where it opens is the controls and interface. It operates off of 120 and the electrical uh, plug is again, watertight, airtight, but it's on the side of the case. So then we have our unit that actually does the paint removal with all the safety features that anyone would want. Um, you know, the, the fear is that it's gonna be like Star Wars and, and an operator is gonna turn and they're going to put this light onto someone. It, it really, when it defocuses off of its surface, the light spreads so wide that it's not going to do, uh, you may get a pinch or something like that, but it's not gonna cut you in two. Um, a sandblast or grit blast is gonna do uh, a lot more damage to the human skin than what the laser will do. But this is just a, a sample of what it actually looks like um, when it's running out in the field. So I'm doing something new today. Let's go see what they're doing. So this is actually back to the shop. This handheld is under three pounds. It's ergonomically designed for left and right hand each side people um, so that they're comfortable using it. Um, and the sandblast guys are out there, it's really going to hurt them. You can actually put this with a magnetic robot and put it on the side of the robot and let it climb. Um, put it on the side of the bridge, let it go right down those rails. Um, again, so that you're keeping humans out of harm's way. But you can see how it just eats the rust um, and moves everything off. We're also looking at how we can um, collaborate with another company and make these available across the U.S for all types of paint crews that go off on different kinds of buildings. So um, laser is proven technology. Uh, as we go through time, the cost has dramatically decreased, especially as we're getting into the fiber delivered uh, lasers and the beam delivery 
components are improving greatly. And with all the sensors and the controls and the safety, we can literally make a factory of the future in a just about any type of maintenance repair operations centers. Um, there's a cost savings, there's an environmental savings, um, but the big hurdle is it's technology has challenges and changes. Um, you have to have buy-in from your corporate that they want to make this sustainable application. Um, it requires a lot of communication. It requires people working together, but we have to start working together and implement some of these new technologies so that we're not left behind um, some of our adversaries. And that's one of the biggest things right now between China and um, you know what's going on with Russia, how how can we move this technology and keep it here? Well, it's with companies like mine, um, with Skyne, with some of these other startups that, that you see coming. So I hope um, while everyone is afraid of change, uh, this change is really necessary. We need it and we need to get there. So with that, um, I welcome you to go to our website, look at some of the things that we can do. Uh, if there's applications that you want to develop, we can work with you. We have the contacts globally to work in other countries and um, do some fantastic things. And I guess I'll go now to see if there's any questions. Sure, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a lovely presentation. And these videos were very intriguing and it was very exciting to see the uh, things moving on. Uh, I love those videos which you presented. Thank you, Suzanne. And obviously, visual appeal is very important. You see, then you feel it and then you experience it. That's how it works. So there's no question at this point, Suzanne, and we are out of time as well. So thank you, Suzanne, for your lovely presentation. We'll stay connected and you have your coordinates. You can share your PPT with us. We will share it with all the audience as well as the speakers. And anybody who wants to get in touch with you, they can get in touch. Yeah. Yes, I'll upload that and make sure you can get it. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay, thank you. We'll, thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Our pleasure. We'll quickly move on to our next presenter, Mazda Irani, who is CTO of Ashaw Energy. His topic is Big Step Towards Digitalization in Oil and Gas. Oh, cool. It's getting visible. Let me swap to this. Now everyone sees me, Nitin? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks for having me. And so... I try to smooth it down, I think, because um, from what I see in the previous and the previous ones, um, it's more about the uh, general topics and just give a um, kind of a general understanding of what's going on. So, um, so to, I, I think I'm the only one talking about the oil and gas side. Um, and in the oil and gas. Um, digitalization and big topic. So I try to cover some of the issues and what we think that the solution would be at the Asher Energy and what we're providing. And so I try to not be a pitch, um, like a sales pitch, but be some technical stuff as, um, as well. So the stuff that, if you're in oil and gas pretty much, and if you're not even in oil and gas, like what do you hear from uh, the big players in the oil and gas, there are two things. Um, digital twins, that means you have the system that predict your um, oil field pretty much. And the other one is net zero and energy transition, like the things like geothermal moving to hydrogen, solar energy, uh, winds, um, reducing the footprints, like carbon, uh, carbon footprints. So, but the focus of our company is on digital twin and what we think would be the solution. So to reach out and to move to the digital field, uh, there are four main steps, uh, really. So 
So the first one is data preparation. So that means we need the dashboards. We need something that measures and monitors the stuff in the digital format and send it to somewhere or the data uh, center. The other one is to have the modeling and prediction capability. That's the part we are involved at the moment. And the other ones is to assign some sort of risk probability or uncertainty to that sort of measurement. And the last one is automation. So uh, we kind of covered all those four uh, in our format. We don't have a sensor put in the field, but we read all the sensors. Uh, we have a platform that everybody goes there. We do the simulation, both AI and physical, coupled, and then we go assign some sort of uncertainty to it. And then uh, we haven't done the automation yet, but that's the next stage we're going to go. So the focus of this today, I'm going to talk about uh, this short presentation, like 20 minutes, 30 minutes thing. It's all about what is the right decision and where we have to go. So we don't know at this point which way is the right decision for us to go and what would be the prediction uh, would be. So if you're working in the oil field, you only have control on the valves, injectors, and the pumps and those stuff. But having the faster turns on pumps, we create more delta P, we have more rates, but is that be consistent? Or we have an injector and you're gonna inject more. So all those stuff only can be optimized if you have a good predictor. So that's the discussion I'm gonna have today. So, so the problem in the world of the oil and gas at the moment, there are two problems I'm going to talk about. One of it is we think that physics doesn't matter on the AI format, and we just go on the AI and treat it like a Facebook and Google. I'm going to talk about it, what's the difference in the oil and gas world and say, okay, we have a fast response here and we have the best AI system and we're going to predict it where it goes. But is that fast? first predictions or first optimized format going to be consistent. So if this is the oil rate that provides us the money and we do something that get a high ramp here, get consistent. Or we have to focus on the long run and having a longer oil rate. So, so one of the issues that most of these AI systems that we are currently working on without focusing on what's happening inside the oil and gas, like a oil reservoir or producer, whatever segments in that system is, we looking for the short-term feedbacks. And that's all we do. And as a result, uh, I put a few examples here. These are real examples. So based on those predictions, we go and design or use the format we're gonna do these wells and this is the well that they converted to these new techniques of completion they call it icds based on the design they have the short-term predictions they have and you see the increase in the order it was very consistent for a good time of two years and they do the same thing on the well next to it and what happens the same sort of constraint the same sort of geology pretty much but as a result, we have less than 50% oil rate in the next three years. So we lose huge amount of money here, and the gain was something about 20, 30% here. So normally, the problem in the oil and gas is the gains increase the oil rate. Normally, is like very small, 10%, 20%. But if you do the wrong stuff, you may go to 10% of the oil rate. So like 20%, like it drops in the oil rate, the negative impact of bad design, you know, always larger positive impact of the good design. So, so it's normally we have to have the good design, good predictions, good operation, good AI system to minimize the negative part and increase the positive part. The focus normally should be that way. So that's, what we get to this graphic in. 
So focusing on near future is not going to resolve the problem. So that's been problematic for the last 10 years, and we know it. And we didn't get much uh, good results because now AI in oil and gas been mature enough that we are like we have pilots that been around five six years and we've seen the results. Okay, so what we should do? So we have to think about what we do at the moment. So one way is we assume there is no system. The reservoir does not the system. The wellbore is not a system. The pump is not a system. It's a bunch of data that we read it on the surface and we use these fast, furious, and magnificent type of mathematical approaches that we have on the AI format and um, recurrent neural network, um, LSTM, a lot of plant uh, luxury names these days, and more about more math, more prediction, more training on the data. And we do it, but it was failed. Uh, because the problem mainly with the AI systems that we're dealing with at the moment is the missing two big portion. The missing the location, so they have no idea about the spatial location, and the missing the time. So by saying the time is, assume you have an injector inside the reservoir, it takes some time for the water reach your producer, and with the AI system, you don't see that. You don't see the location of your uh, well, like if you have a producer, how far is that from that uh, location of that injector? Is that kind of impacting so, um, your solution? So that's what we're talking about, about the location. So they're missing these spatial and temporal aspects. So the solution at the moment is, the fastest solution is, we say, okay, there is some physics associated with this. And we don't want to find out what the actual physics is. We just have a formula. We just come up with this formula. And the common practice is in the States, they say, OK, decline curve is happening. Let's apply decline curve and AI together. So I'm going to put a few examples of those. Uh, decline curve analysis is. Um, they call it DCA. And the, the problem is we normally we don't want to be biased in doing any AI uh, solution. And we just want to see how unbiased we are and how intelligent we are in these systems. So normally, is, this is one of the amazing papers in that world. And you see a lot of downsides to it. Because just go looking at taking the AI would not be beneficial. So let's talk about this paper. Is these are the actual data, the blue, and this is the decline curve match to it. And it's not really match to it by just putting the normal way and regression, those are stuff. It's matched to it using automated um, AI systems, which is pretty much the same type of matching that you used to do using Excel and that type of. And the red one is what's actual happens. And this is a short prediction they do. And this is the prediction they have AI plus those decline curves. So what they do wrongly, that's they say, OK, it's like a stock market. OK, so we have some sort of a behavior of the people, which is not periodic. And that's called GT. We just assume this is like declining by time. And there is one SD, which can be any fourth portion of the Fourier or anything, but it has to be periodic. And they try to use that periodic to match these and change the coefficients for this to match the whole average. So results you see here is not that great. The problem with this type of thing is here, um, we go up here, uh, it's a better one here. We go up here and come down here, and we go vice versa here. So it's really we can't even match the trends using this type of system. And the problem is these type of data that we're treating are not the same. So we think these are the people that find and uh, having the stocks pretty much uh, buying and uh, selling the stocks. 
But the reservoir is not like that. Reservoir is this data that coming down is due to something physical. Like for example, you drop the pressure with the pump or you have some buildup of something. And without having all those missing points and missing physics in your AI, at the end, no matter what we do, no matter what we use, we're not gonna get to the magnificent results. This is even, they put very uh, sophisticated profit model here and they see that the results get worse. And the nice thing about the new AI is that they have in the air oil and gas is you can assign uncertainty to it, okay? So we have a great platform of different AI system at the moment, but the, the way, the vision we have to solve the problem is the issue. So it's not about the math. It's not about we doing anything wrong. So now we, the approach in the oil and gas is to go and train more and more. So instead of having the narrow network that you just have a fast forward and back propagation thing, we have these recurrent neural networks that even these weight factors, it just getting the feedbacks from the previous time and they just training or LSTM uh, that they use it for the short term results. It has a gate system. So a lot of math coming, but is that improve? Uh, not because we are really looking at the wrong data set because the data set we are looking doesn't have a lot of inputs. And to diagnose those inputs and to filter those inputs and to clean up those inputs and put it in the right format for the AI, you have to assign some physics to it. So the people came in like us and say, okay, let's do the hybrid model. And the hybrid is, okay, so we do some simulation or some numerical calculations and we try to minimize the gap and it's also not helpful. The problem is we are still, the physics model dominate the whole system, not the AI system in these type of calculations because we always try to calculate the difference. And those difference is really as a result of um, fluctuation in the data. It's not the actual um, driver for us. And the other problem is we do everything on the surface and a lot of things happens on, on the surface, like uh, inside the reservoir, if we want to put these new valves, these new systems in the reservoir, we don't see the effects of those. So what would be the, the solution? So the solution now we're working on in the ASHA is, so we have AI at the grid up, and really we had the, uh, the connection between um, the reservoir grid and, and the reservoir. And so we do the numerical simulation, but every grid of the reservoir, for example, is connected to these wells. And there is an AI system there that plays with it. So it's AI inside your physics model. So the physics model has a lot of parameters and those parameters inside every grid is tuned by AI. So they call it AI history match uh, sort of thing. And this is not the new thing. They have done pretty similar stuff in the CFD, computational fluid dynamics before. So in the computational fluid dynamics is, so we say, okay, Nebula Stokes is the name that they use for the modeling these stuff. But once the velocity goes high in those systems, they can use those routine equations. And the red one is for the low uh, velocity and you see the physics really honor it. But you see the red one does not honor the high turbulence. So they become in the grid side they put new equations. They say these are turbulence equations. That's pretty much what we do in the reservoir level. We say these turbulence equations are not being used using the AI, and the, um, this is the oldest stuff, but they try to use care feeding, something that based on the data they have, and some of the correlations they change. They say this is the virtual uh, roughness here, virtual thing. And they see a lot of matching, a lot of changes happens and the turbulent now 
works perfectly fine. And all these Boeings, uh, airplanes, and NASA spaceships really using this type of turbulence system. And the physics is important because I'm just learning out of time. And a lot of physics, like erosion, corrosion, and those are stuff in the oil and gas. Like the previous talk was about um, having this, some sort of corrosion on the surface. But we have a lot of these valves. We are erodes this stuff. And we have to assign those physics into our model. Okay? It's like you work in a stock market and you don't know about Elon Musk going to be tweeting. But in oil and gas, you know that Elon Musk is going to tweet tomorrow and got to put the word Dodge, for example, for the Dodge coin. But we always know that these things are happening. But the thing about the oil and gas is that like, we know the pump's going to be running tomorrow faster or we're going to put more injector. The result that we have to predict using AI, what would be the impact? So we use... We have to be some sort of the physics base to capture those stuff. So let me just have the last thing like our platform. And if you want to be on AI, you can't just use the similar like a simple platforms like a Python and those codes. And uh, those are I call it um, some sort of new format of Excel spreadsheets. You have to be coding the stuff into your platform. And so, for example, any every stuff had to be simple. Like it used to be, so this is the simple well with the reservoir. So it used to be like four or five softwares modeling this in oil and gas. So we put everything in a simple format and um, in one software. And now we're adding AI to it. And we have every component of the physics into it. So some of the physics, you don't need AI for it. Like one of those is PVT that I'm showing right now. And as a, But the other part is you have to have the complexity of your wells or reservoir really assigned to it. So one of the things we're missing in a lot of things that in the oil and gas is we don't capture the complexity. And nowadays, every joint of these horizontal wells, they have a valve. And we're capturing all of those. We should capture everything in the package. So nowadays, they say, okay, because they can model these stuff, they pack like 20 joints in one joint, and those sort of things are really not helpful. So the other thing is, you have to be uh, fast in the runtime. It can be both AI stuff, uh, I'm just showing the erosion here. So I'm just showing the simulation time for one well with the reservoir around it, and we're having so many FCDs, uh, and you see it only takes five seconds here. And I use very simple uh, machine to show like systems really doesn't matter in new way of coding because we have a great access to parallelization in every machine. It's not just you have to have a cloud system. You can have every machine, with, and it's a very uh, simple machine that I'm using. So you have to model a lot of the complexity and then AI come over. It's not just AI comes and do the magic and the stuff you don't have. And the other thing you have to measure and capture every element of the well. So you, if you have the temperature system that you monitoring, if you have a pressure system that monitoring, you have to capture every moment of it. You can't just say, Say I'm averaging it for a month. I'm averaging this thing for like a year. If you do those stuff, no matter what you're doing on your AI format, you would not be successful on doing the uh, on doing the AI. So and this is just a picture of one of those valves uh, that is software model and, uh, and use a CFD for it. And so you see a lot of elements using different type of analysis in this type of new systems that we're using on. And so, for example, for valves, we use CFD. For the well bores, we're using uh, fractional flow and nodal analysis. For reservoirs, we use finite difference. For the reservoir talking to um, the well bore, we're using the boundary element. So, and for geomechanics, we're using finite elements. And for fractures, we use fracture mechanics. So, everything has to be in the format of the routine way with them as robust as you can go 
and then you put AI on top of it for every element inside of it that they're connecting with. And then you do AI combining with those, and you can go advanced systems like LSTM, recurrent and other network, whatever you want to do, you do it, but you have to at least capture the special effect and the temporal effect in these type of uh, physics-based problems uh, using the right physics. By saying that, I'm done, and I'm really go on 27 minutes. Let me just take my share screen. It goes um, the mirror format. Sure. Thank you, Mazda. Thank you. Thank you for uh, giving a perspective on how uh, digitalization is going on in oil and gas. Uh, I know it's a it, that that's the beauty of uh, that's the beauty of uh, these type of events where you get to showcase different variety yeah, of I think you're on mute, maybe. things which is getting used. Yeah, Abhi. No issues. Yeah, so. Yeah, I thought that uh, he asked few, uh, one question to you. So no, no, thank you, thank you, Mazda, for a lovely presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it to hear about what is happening in oil and gas sector, and it's it's, it's always an eye opener to see uh, what things are going on in every industry. Thanks a lot, Mazda, yeah. for your lovely in, insight. Yeah. yeah, and we'll stay connected. We'll get in touch with you after this event as well. Thank you. Sure, 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 sure. So, uh, guys uh, who are there in the audience, uh, so we have Nick, who is the last presenter for the day. He's uh, the VP of Production Modeling Corporation. His topic is industrial and system engineering. So, if you want to ask any question to Nick, you can type in, in the Q&A section as and when he speaks, so that those questions can be answered by him. Over to you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. My audio okay? Yes, perfect. And uh, how about uh, being able to project my screen? Does that work? I'm not seeing that. Not. not seeing. All right. Let's do this. And we have screen sharing. And we'll go with the slideshow. Yes. Coming. How are we doing Perfect. now? Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank Perfect. you. Nick Andriel here. Um, I will have a slightly different uh, approach in the discussion today. Uh, we've covered a lot of very interesting material. Some just one, just one more, just one thing to add, Nick. Here, uh, so there's a hide button which I can see in the screen. Uh, if you can put it hide, you can click on that hide uh, on the screen. There's a it's showing that you are sharing your screen and yes. there's a stop sharing and hide option there. Yes, now it is okay. Full. Thank you. Got it. Got it. Good. Thank you. So my presentation today is going to be a little bit different than what we've seen today so far. Uh, there has been some fantastic technical materials presented. Um, and in preparation for today's discussion, it uh, was very curious for me that um, many years ago, uh, when I had, uh, let's say, left the assembly plant where I had grown up and got my education, I went and started a group, I went and, and was joining a group, uh, General Motors at the time was Fisher Body and it was called the Adam Group. And it stood for the Advanced Design and Manufacturing. The intent was to design manufacturing systems that would be 10 years in the future. Of course, if we did the math, that would have been, you know, uh, a plant that would have been in existence some 20 years ago. Uh, but the idea is very uh, curious in that this type of thinking is uh, been has been going on in large industries. What are we doing? Where are we going? And what are things going to look like? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to give you a little perspective on what is PMC, Production Modeling Corporation, and the credentials that we bring to the table. Um, PMC has been around for a number of decades, and we have a discrete event, throughput simulation, modeling engineers. We do advanced simulation for other engineering companies. I, I mention that because I see that as quite a statement of credentials in that not only do we have a number of diverse clients, but some of our clients are also other engineering companies and 
the synergies uh, are very important. The partnerships are very important because none of this future work can be done in a silo. It's all integrated. Uh, so we have uh, a rather proficient set of engineers, both here and in other countries where we're doing simulation and digital twin work together. Um, <clears throat> when we're looking at um, the uh, areas of focus that PMC provides, core industrial engineering, reality capture and building information modeling, the simulation of manufacturing, but we'll see it's not just manufacturing, then of course a digital twin and what does that mean? So there's about 150 engineers that we've got. Our headquarters are in Dearborn, Michigan, just outside of Detroit. And we've got strong operations in India uh, and uh, strong operations in Mexico, as well as other operations elsewhere. But those are our hubs. We grew up in Detroit. So much of the work that we've done has been based on uh, automotive, manufacturing, industry, robotic, and so on. Uh, however, what we've discovered is that the learnings, the methods, and the lessons learned from our automotive excellence have really allowed us to take some of that and expand not just from the internal combustion engine and the electric vehicles, but also into other industries well, such as wholesaling, warehousing. You might notice some of the Amazon signals. There's a huge market today for industrial engineering on the distribution models for uh, all of the goods and services that are coming from all over the world. Another topic that we're engaging in is a thing called vert vertical farming. If you consider the yield per acre, I'm not a farmer, but the year, yield per acre on cabbage and some of the past years that we'd have and trying to optimize how much growth you'd have in an acre. And now you consider that you've got a dozen rows tall on that same vertical farming scenario, the yield per acre has just gone through the roof. And I give that credit to industrial engineers, manufacturing solutions on efficiency, layout, processes, how long it takes to mill and drill metal is a, set, is a function of time and duration, how long it takes to germinate a plant is still time and process. So we're using these techniques, not just in automotive, not just, just in industry, but in other aspects. And this is very exciting for us. Naturally, uh, building a ship, like we saw in the earlier version where we were taking rust off of the old ships, that's a whole city in there building those. And the process and the scanning, uh, it's a huge piece of our industrial engineering work as well. When we started laser scanning the buildings for manufacturing facilities and taking those and turning those into 3D models, we spurned an entire new industry for us, which was the AEC, the, you know, the architectural engineering construction business. And so scanning buildings, bridges, cities for us has also become an entire department where we're using that technology, again, that grew out of the work that we did out of Detroit. Uh, interestingly enough, some of our largest clients have also been what we call multi-site clients, where you're looking at these long list of McDonald's or 7-Elevens or, or, uh, or what does it take to build a taco? And what does it take for the building that they're in? So a lot of the industrial engineering work that we're doing spans a lot of different, very interesting, very exciting industries. One of the ones that uh, we're having uh, uh, quite a, uh, an exciting time with is people, where we can decide that a machine performs at a certain rate and it needs to be on a conveyor and there's just lack time between this machine and that machine. When we consider people and they have a mission, they're going to the bank, they're going to their seat, they're going to the theater, and they have certain ability to move maybe a 20-year-old, maybe a 50-year-old, maybe a handicapped, maybe a person pulling a stroller. How do they move? And if we had 100,000 of them doing their thing, what does that look like? 
and we can simulate that as well. So how big should the roads be? How wide should the gates be? And what happens if there's a panic? How do we handle that? So all of this is industrial engineering work that we are very active on, having a great time, enjoying the applying of technology that we've learned in Detroit to all of these other industries. So <clears throat> for us to be able to do this well, we need to create a virtual functionality, a digital twin. I say virtual functionality before I say digital twin, because if we just have a picture or if we just have what I call the spray paint of something, that's just an image. The functionality is what we're looking for. Perhaps one of you in the audience is interested in looking at the functionality of the energy required to power this equipment. Maybe somebody else is interested. What is the output? How many parts can I get out per hour of this stuff? Maybe somebody else is interested in how do I make sure the air is clean, that people are there to be able to breathe and air exchanges. The functionality of your system is the digital twin that is relevant to what you're doing. So forgive me, this is PowerPoint. So I'm going to try to give you this little image. So here is a digital image of a basketball. Okay. Um, is it a digital image? If I was to perhaps drop this ball, it doesn't bounce. Well, why? Because it's just a digital picture. For us to make a digital twin out of this basketball and pretend like it bounces, what do we need to know? Probably things like the hysteresis of the rubber or the air pressure or the hardness of the floor. So any digital twin that we're trying to create has to be programmed according to the performance characteristics that we're seeking to model, okay? So in the simple instance of a basketball, we need to know a few things. Model that, and you have a digital twin. Now we get a little more complicated, okay? If we're into a manufacturing setting, and this is a rather old picture, but the philosophy is the same. If we're going to do a digital twin of a factory, let's say, here is the product. Need to have that in 3D. The entire digital twin of the product, since we're talking manufacturing, we're not interested in how fast it'll drive. We're not interested in how comfortable the seat is. That's a whole different topic. Here I need to know, let's pick on the door. Uh, if I'm going to be loading the door onto the car in the manufacturing facility, I may need to know the center of gravity, the size, the areas of uh, dimensional accuracy. Those are relevant to the digital twin of the manufacturing process for the car, as is the facility. How level is the floor? Where are the columns? As is the equipment, the robots, the conveyors, the PCs, the people, ergonomic simulation. You put all of these things together and you have now created a digital twin of a manufacturing facility that many of us are familiar with. And we have to be careful to make sure that we are modeling that those parameters that we're interested in learning something about. Maybe it's throughput. Maybe it's energy consumption. Maybe it's, you know, the electricity needed. Okay. We decide what that is. That's what our client is looking for. Uh, and that's what we do from an engineering consulting standpoint. Here's a, uh, here's a picture of a laser scan image. On the left, you can see a ferro scanner. And on the top right, you see those little black dots, which are every place that we place the scanner and grab laser data, grab laser data, and then knit it together. It looks like a picture. It's amazing. But it's just laser points, clouds assembled by laser scans. So why is that relevant? Because it is crucial for us to be able to take these scans with exact dimensions and then interpret those into, well, what is that? Is that a column? Well, then let's replace the dumb point clouds with an intelligent parametric model of a column, of a robot, of a rack, of a tool, and so on. So you can imagine that having intelligent libraries of parts that allow us to replace the point cloud with actual parametric smart models with metadata that's associated to it. Oh, we know this is a KUKA robot. Therefore, there's a whole library of stuff that we know about its ability to move the kinematics, the energy requirement. That data goes along with the model that we're building. So 
In PMC, we do the industrial engineering core time studies, layouts, ergonomic improvements, and so on. We'll do the what we call reality capture, capture the information about the physical space, and then marry that up so that we can do our digital twin, uh, do the dynamic and static simulation or throughput or ergonomics. Okay, and ov- obviously there's quality and operational excellence that go into the processes. So let's look at a little bit now on how we would do simulation. We are, call it agnostic, on which simulation tool we want to use. But if you tell me that we're doing something that's all about conveyors and distribution of, of boxes, like a wet horse, like a wholesale uh, you know, warehousing distribution. Well, we'll go, so this is the tool. You, but maybe you want to do a robotic simulation. This is the tool you use. So as any uh, tradesman would tell you, you need a hammer and a saw and a screwdriver and a pair of pliers. Those are all tools in your toolbox. And the proper technician will know which tools to use and when to use them. And that's the whole point of being able to make digital twins and the tools that we use to analyze whatever it is that our output is being, uh, I'll call it from a consulting standpoint, what we're getting paid to create. Um, Let's talk a little bit about data. Now this is gonna be very high level, but bear with me for a second. Um, We all understand that there are certain data things. For example, if we were to think about the height of people in your city, we would imagine it to be a normal distribution. There are tall people, short people, and here's the average. So we can internalize what a data distribution looks like for the height of people. Let's try another one. If you turn water on and you turn water off using a valve, it's a square wave. In other words, it's either on or it's off. On or off. Okay. Let's try another one. Uh, People arriving on time to class. Most people will arrive just before class is there and there'll be some that show up late. I use these three simple examples because when we simulate a event, a plant operation, a distribution of whatever it is we're doing, we have to understand what is the probability of things happening, parts coming, people arriving to work, the ability of of equipment to start and and to turn on and turn off. So we use these models, okay? And we get pretty close. We get pretty close. And the more historical data we have, the more accurate we are in creating the models that represent what we're doing. But then reality happens, okay? So this little funny image shows you, you know, the box is just not making it down the conveyor, okay? Is that predictable? Ah, All right, these are the things that fall in the face of our modeling. So what do we really need to do? We need to immediately replace the data that we have modeled from a probability distribution with reality. And that means that we're introducing some kind of sensors. I love this little Arduino thing, the size of a quart, and it'll tell you temperature, vibration, pressure, movement, orientation, all kinds of stuff on a little thing the size of your quarter. Meaning that for the factory of the future, and many today, everything that's going on in the plant can be identified, can be sensed, and we update the model that we thought was, this is how it's going to run. But I just got some new information that something fell off the conveyor. This thing broke. This thing is not right. So we replace real-time information with the actual things that are going on. Now, that brings us into something that we've been talking about for the last couple hours, and that's predictive and preventative maintenance. And we're going to get into that in a lot more detail here. So when we look at how things have been running, It used to be maintenance schedules. We'd have historical data, manufacturing specs, and then we got better. We said, ah, let's have preventative maintenance. Let's replace things before they fail and do it conveniently, maybe on a Sunday. And then we got even better. We said, let's have prescriptive maintenance. Things are customized and programs made specifically for each piece of equipment. This one's new, so I don't have to replace it so often. This one's older, I better, so prescriptive. And now I've talked a lot about the predictive maintenance, where we sense the key product, you know, information, the KPIs. We are sensing 
telltale data. And by telltale data, I'm talking about is the motor heating up? Is it vibrating? Is it making noise? It shouldn't be doing that. Why is it doing that? And of course, we can predict failures with that information. And, and that's as far as I'm going to go on this high level predictive maintenance because it's key. We've had a, a lot of uh, partners that we've been dealing with. Here's this one company where a digital twin of a very complex machine okay, is counting on all of its subsystems functioning and the, operatal, the operating parameters are being sensed. Is this working? Is this vibrating? Is this heating up beyond its operating parameters? Okay. So in a complex machine, a digital twin is intended for us to know what are the key things that we need to know and how do we monitor them and get this feedback long before it actually fails. Let's look at the same thing now for an entire facility. With the Internet of Things and Industry 4.0, that means we've got these sensors, not just on this one piece of equipment, but all over the plant. And in about a couple of slides, we're saying, well, why the plant? Why not? The complex, why not the city? The same idea of what we've learned in smart factories turns into being useful for smart cities. And you'll see that much of the learning that we've done here is expanding to other places. Here's one of my favorite companies. They do line by line ladder logic analysis where they're looking at each line item performing. So if the ladder logic says, open a clamp, close a clamp, move this, move this back. And you know the time is supposed to be one and a half seconds and it took two seconds, something imperceptible to you and I. You go, hold it, why, why, why are taking longer? Is there grit in, these, in the uh, mechanisms? Is there a leak in the hydraulics? Be able from a line by line item in a PLC, understand what is going on with the equipment and can we prevent it? And if everything is running fine, you still ask the question, well, why is there a lag between this movement and that movement? You can actually reduce waste by looking at it at that level. So this is the kind of understanding that our factories are doing now and certainly in 10 years from now. I'm going to have a couple different uh, interesting things I'm going to throw at you. Remote consulting is critical. Uh, I've gone to so many plant reviews with two or three people, and we've looked at the different problems that we've been asked to look at. But by using smart glasses and technology like that, we're all very comfortable with working from home, doing collaboration. And yet, uh, by putting on a pair of smart glasses, my whole team can see what I see when I'm walking through the plant or being counseled on how to fix a diesel engine or what wires to connect when you're going out to do a repair. You have the expert in one spot. He could be in any country, in any location. And you've got people out in the field be, being actually hands-on. So I think that this is a huge uh, opportunity for us to do remote consulting. Um, you remember this little chart about all the things that are going on to create a digital twin? Um, the engineering process is a collaboration of these converging data sets. So when we started talking about blockchain here about an hour ago, the entire blockchain idea means that there is traceability, accountability, and all of the elements that go into creating a complex digital twin are now traceable. And so you have ownership of where the data is coming from. You can have your billing system accordingly. You can have your accountability accordingly. You can make changes as you need. It is one of the huge advantages we're going to find tomorrow by having all of this digital twin complex organization in a blockchain format that people can own, people can have accountable, be accountable to, and can build to. We ran across a very interesting uh, situation. I'm going to just touch base with you for a uh, minute, and that is uh, a 3D map of the Earth, which is, if you, everybody's familiar with pixels, this is called voxels. So 3D mapping of the Earth, which means that every cube has got a identity. And as we are going through a uh, city or a plant or an ocean, uh, we have identified 
each of those voxels and we can take those and put those into our simulation. Maybe there's nothing here, but in a plant, there's all kinds of points. When we do our laser scanning, we turn those into uh, identities of these different parts. We fill them in and identify each voxel with this information, and it has metadata associated with it. And the 4D version is if there's movement or change, which is a whole topic all by itself. Uh, but we are applying what we're learning in industry and applying it to cities. And there is also learning that we're doing from how they're capturing global information, geospatial information information for smart city work and bringing it back into industry. So there is a conversion of this information. When we do smart factories, there are smart campuses like universities or sports stadiums or parks. And the same kind of uh, solutions that we're creating for industry, we can create for a smart city. In fact, when you look at the layering of a city, which is not much different than the layering we have in a plant, meaning that maybe I've got hydraulics and electric and, and physical spaces for you know my, my conveyance systems and so on. When you're looking at the information for a city, you have much of the same kind of layering information, which all then has to work together. So uh, that's why I'm saying what we're learning from Detroit is going into cities and what we're learning from cities is coming back together. Um, we have integrated services uh, and we're clearly understanding that everything that is needed uh, for a functioning factory for tomorrow will be done by just one company. Uh, but we are very interested in partnering, very interested in working together with consortiums. And that's been a lot of what uh, we've been involved in doing. My mission, build partnerships, of course, grow the business, uh, and implement business efficiencies in a lot of different places. Um, so that's my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nick. And uh, thanks for uh, taking us through all the slides which you had, uh, interesting slides. And uh, I, I like the last slide from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> you like to build partnerships and all those stuff. And I know it's, a, it's something which is very good and you, you need to uh, leverage on that uh, because that is what the world is moving for. Build more collaboration, build more partnerships. That's how you Indeed. succeed. It's, it's ever-evolving digital world. Thank you, Thank Nick. You Thank you for your, me. yeah, yeah. Thank you for your lovely thought process uh, and your uh, interest in the panel discussion as well. You you were involved in that, so I think it was a lovely one. Thank, thanks, Nick. Thanks for you that. Thank so I don't see any questions for you. So I'll just wrap up. Okay. So, uh, so uh, to wrap up, we would, we would like to thank our technology partner, that is Digit7. They have a great innovation lab of 15,000 square feet in Richardson, Dallas, uh, Texas. And any of you are dropping by, can always go to their office, have a look to feel that. To understand more in depth, connect with them and to suggest any aspect, all of you can go through their website, that is www.digit7.io and closely liaison with them. Also, we would like to thank our community partners, speakers, and attendees who came together for enriching knowledge through this forum. We had a great set of speakers since morning who came together to share thoughts. Just for your information, today's event was broadcasted in the YouTube and the Facebook page of our company. So it will be there. You all can go and see the recording anytime. Please log on to our website and like the social media channels. We'll be sharing lots of knowledge sharing topics, details, announcement of next events, and much more, which will help you register and attend the same. There are lots more in store for subsequent months as well, with focus on how technology is driving transportation, image annotation, retail industry, aviation, and much more. So request all of you to keep connected with us. Enjoy the learning. Thanks and take good care of yourself. Have a lovely weekend, guys. Bye. Take care, everyone. We'll stay connected. Thank you.